I'm going to first take the attendance of uh, ZBA members. Uh, Robert Decker. Kathy Felton. Present. Adam Sokolowski. Good evening, present. Uh, I am present. Bernard Sadowski. Alexander. I'm here. John Sabursky. David Potter. Present. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> this is uh, a hearing to address um, and is it Colo? Is that correct? And Colo is uh, has applied for a special permit to construct a new single single family residence to be located on existing house lot in a non conforming lot. Okay, do you have something you would like to tell us? Um, yes, my name is Ann Colo. I currently uh, own the property on one steam mill road. Um, I have with me today Robin Provost from Morian Schmidt, who is would be the general contractor mm -hmm. on the project. Should it be should it move forward? And I believe John Wyman is also attending, who is the architect on the project. Uh, just take a minute to tell you just just a minute about myself and about the project. I work as a financial manager at a software company in Kronos in Lowell. I've been there about 20 years and I've lived here on one steam mill road about five years owning the property for three and a half. I bought it from Mike Russo in uh, March of 2017. Um, I love this area and the neighborhood and the lot that I'm on and I've tried to design with Robin and John a property or construction that would be very conducive and aesthetically pleasing to the neighborhood and would fit in nicely with the other homes around around the area. Um, the reason really I'm looking for a bit bigger, bigger house is um, I work from home almost 100% of the time now with COVID, but even before then, the home office area. And also I care for both of my parents, elderly parents who are 90 and 85 with Alzheimer's. And um, I'm envisioning that they're going to be with me at some point in the near future. So I did contemplate renovating the existing structure that's here, um, but it's very camp-like and it was the consensus of, you know, the builders that it would really be cost prohibitive to do that because the construction is, is not really in, in great shape here. Um, so I thank you for your consideration of, of this request and your time today and I'll just turn it over to any questions you may have for, for all of us. Okay, board members, any questions? Alex? No. Um, Mr. Decker, are you in on this one or not? Can't hear him. He's muted. Okay, he's he's out, so let's um, tell him he's tell him he's muted. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Decker, you're muted. Mr. Sokolowski, questions? I, yeah, well, I mean, uh, I saw the design. It, it looks like a beautiful structure, but uh, what's the hardship? This is for a special permit, correct? It is, yes. So it's not a variance, it's a special permit? Correct. Okay, to continue is we're not seeing that this is a hardship case. Is that correct? That's so correct. I think that um, if I if, can I speak? Yes. I'm not sure if it's open or not. <laughs> yes, it's open. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, just the only thing I ask is I'm sorry. I, I give us your name, please, because this has to go into record, so we have to know who we're speaking to. Okay. So it has to be recorded as a public document. Okay, great, thank you. So this is Robin Provost from Maury and Schmidt General Contractors. So I think that we requested special permit based on the kind of the letter we received from the building commissioner. And I'm hoping that we're correct in what we were requesting. Okay, uh, Mr. Walden, you want to address that issue? 
Are you on, Mr. Waldron? Yes, on you. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm off the commute now. Um, well, it's a non-conforming lot in frontage and square footage, so I mean, I feel as though it would require a special permit if you're going to construct a house on it. Yeah. Okay. What Thank is you. what is what is what makes it non-conforming? What what's there's not enough frontage for the size of the building. No, it just requires 200 feet of frontage to build a house. Huh? To build house. a house? Yes, in the residential agriculture area, you need 200 feet of frontage. Then you need 60,000 square feet of of land. Hold on a second here. We the house, the lot has 33,747, so it's pretty short on square footage and it has I don't know. It has a shared. It has a shared driveway, so the frontage is a little, little sketchy here. It cuts through another lot, um, right. so it has hardly any frontage. But that that's the reason why it's there. Uh huh. Um, Mr. Sokolowski, does that answer your question? Yeah, I. I pulled it back up and just went over the application. Now we got a lot on. I got my stuff spread out over here, but um, it, it is it's a shared driveway. It's a second unit back, not right up against the road. Correct, Miss Cole? Yes. Correct. So yes. It's, so it's it's almost it's a we'd almost be creating another flag lot if we were to allow this, which has technically no frontage. Um, if we change the lot, I mean, I just think in the spirit of the zoning bylaw. This is not what, you know, building houses behind other houses without the proper square footage is what the people that passed the, the law in that jurisdiction were, were looking for. So in that area of town. Okay. Um, Alex, questions? Mm -hmm. No. Nope. No. I have another question from somebody in the audience. Um, hang on a second, please. We're yep. going to go through the board members first, please. Okay. Yep. And then we'll go. And John's not here. And David, you asked a question. Are you satisfied okay. with your question? Uh, I, I do have a follow-up question. Okay. Yep. Um, would renovations that expanded the footprint also require a special permit? I yes. Would, yeah. Yes. How about if it went higher? Well, the same footprint. If they stayed in the same footprint, no. I would grant a permit if it was on the same footprint. And what if they rebuilt a brand new house on the same footprint that went higher? I would also allow that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Potter. Uh, do we have a someone that's calling in? Or do we have a hand up somewhere? Is that? I have a hand up. Yeah, I'm going to allow him to talk. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. You're welcome. John? Yes. Go ahead. This is John Wyman. Hi, this is John Wyman. I am the designer of this property um, for Ann. Um, the existing house is tiny. It's about um, 600 square feet. And it is pretty much a camp. Um, and there is a common driveway that goes through the Nobacks property off of County Road. and. The, uh, new, I know this house. the new house um, is designed to be um, within the setbacks and is designed to be um, farmhouse looking like the houses in the neighborhood um, and has an attached garage. It will be demolishing an existing garage on the property, a gazebo and a patio. Um, and I just would like to note in the immediate area of um, this piece of property out of 41 adjacent properties, 35 are smaller than Ann's property. And nine, I'm sorry, 19 are smaller than Ann's property and 35 are smaller than the zoning required um, requirements of two acres and 200 feet of frontage. So the majority of the properties in this area are either smaller um, than required or smaller than her property. So the house is, is designed to um, 
be scaled down so that it's not one large mass. Um, the house is roughly twice the size as the original house and would not fit within the existing footprint. Um, the drive would be in the same location. The house is just larger within the same lot. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, Bernie. Yes, Mr. The, the, I got a question as to the existing structure. Is the existing structure uh, meet all the sanitary codes, et cetera, et cetera, today? Or would it cost, be counterproductive to, to make any renovations on it because of the extensive cost to, to bring it up to grade? I'm just saying, is is it a hardship to bring that up the to, to grade, or would it be easier to build a new structure? Um, I would say that based on the existing uh, configuration, the existing materials, the um, lack of energy efficiency, I think that trying to renovate just that that building. Um, or add to it or add a second floor would be cost prohibitive. I don't feel that there is a sufficient um, structural basement to allow any second floor to that. And I think that um, it would be, it would, it would not be a, it would not be a sound base to start continued construction on that, on that building. So in other words, what you're telling me is it's a hardship to, to, to renovate that existing house on its footprint. I would okay. say yes. It's cost prohibitive. Yes. Okay. And that would be hardship, wouldn't it? Or it yes. Could be? Uh, yes. 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 Right. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. As the, builder, I, as the builder, I'm saying yes. I would think it is. Well. I guess Ann would need to maybe answer that a little bit too. But I'm from a construction really point of view, yes. <laughs> The application is for a special permit, but to waive those frontage requirements and what have you, my gut feeling is it requires a variance in addition to whatever else needs to get waived. I don't know what anybody else thinks. Why do you think that? Well, because you, it doesn't have any frontage on a way in existence. It's served by a common driveway. And there are many houses and many particular buildings in this town that are that way. Oh, a and lot of them are owned by private schools that are exempt from this. That's the problem. That, when you, that cite, is, when you cite, cite the other stuff in the neighborhood and uh, you know, that, that's part of the problem where um, you, know, you just look down the street and there's three or four other people that might want to have these flag lots with the right of way behind their own houses because there's seven or eight new houses along Steam Mill Road and there's other property owners back there. So, I mean, to me, when you purchase a property like this, you need to understand it has some serious limitations. Are those, are on those other lots, Adam, are there existing cottages on those other properties? Well, there's existing older houses up there with attached properties and there's basically not a subdivision, but someone sold off lots conforming to our town bylaws and sold them for a decent amount of money, but they all had to be conforming lots. You, did, you didn't sell off pieces of property that had just a deeded access and no frontage on a, on a screw street, and then didn't, you know, and they don't have shared driveways. That's another issue. You have a shared driveway that's, uh, I don't know what the exact footage is on this map, but that's another issue that the town doesn't want, shared, shared driveways and flag lots. Can I ask if there's a house number two on this plan? I see a house number three, a garage that's on Catherine Novak and Mark Novak's land. Then I see a house number one that's on Ann Colo's land. Is there on this map a house number two? No. Okay. No, there is not. Okay. Well, <laughs> Back when the zoning bylaws originally went in in 1966, and then it was tweaked a little bit later, uh, lots were defined as anything that was uh, 
that met the bylaws um, was taxed or separately divided. And then back in the 80s, the planning board in their infinite wisdom changed the zoning bylaw to get rid of all those grandfather lots. And it made lots in old Deerfield, in particular, uh, residential agriculture, you have to have 200 feet of frontage and 60,000 square feet. Okay, prior to that, uh, the requirements, if you had one utility, it was uh, 25,000 square feet and 125 feet of frontage. Okay, but if, if the lot had already existed, it rode and it kept riding. And uh, my point is, I think the application is deficient in the fact that I think it should have asked for a variance and or a special exception as were applicable, but I'm not a lawyer. And, uh, but we can't, the board can't act on a variance without the application for a variance. And the variance has to be built with the uh, particular hardship. And the hardship is uh, it's going to cost more money than what it's worth to fix the existing house. And, and uh, you know, they own a property and they want to uh, continue to live there. They like the site. And, uh, you know, so, but I think it needs to have, I think the board's going to, would be deficient if they didn't think it should have a variance. Uh, you know, the, the variance would be necessary to correct whatever the problem is. <clears throat> but that's my personal opinion. Okay, that is his personal opinion. Now, this does not mean this is what the board says. We are not that's supposed to be giving information about how to set up uh, to set up special permits and variances. This is not coming from the board. This is coming from Mr. Decker because we can get into legal trouble if we start making recommendations of how to fill out uh, these, these permits and variances. The only way it becomes legal is if we take a vote on it and we decide on this. But I think our council is gonna tell us, do not give advice to people on how to set up things. Because once we do that, now we set our own, it's a trap set up so that we get caught up in a situation where you said to do this and said to do that. So if you're, if you're taking someone's advice, this is not coming from this board. So be clear of that. Okay, any other comments? Did you all read the neighbor's letters? Yes. yes. Alex? Um, Bob, did you read those? Yes, I did. Okay. And uh, David, you read those? No, I'm looking for them right now. Okay. Oh, and uh, Adam, did you see, read the letters? Okay, any other questions? Oh. Comments for denial letter. Assessor's comments. Um, I have a question, Mr. Decker. When I took the attendance, you were not here. I was here, but the thing was muted. Okay, all right. So the, now you are present. I am okay. present. He looks present. Yeah, but he has to. When we take the attendance, has to be here. It has to be on a record that he is here and present. He has to. He, unfortunately, that's the way it works. Miss Polo, I just want to ask uh, one question, Mr. Chair, if it's okay with you. Sure. Mr. Chair, is it okay to ask Miss Polo a question? Yes, that's fine. Uh, Ms. Colum, I just want to, I just want to my packet again. I have the letter from the Russo's. Is there any additional letters? Uh, no, the letter from Mr. Russo, he secured some of the neighborhood signatures for me, but that's the only letter. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any more questions? Okay, do I have a uh, motion to close discuss uh, actually close input and go to a discussion on this and take a vote uh, before we go forward um, we have five members I believe we've got mr. Decker miss Felton mr. Uh, Alex no and Adam myself so that's four full-time members and uh, I, I believe Alex you're going to be the alternative on this one so to pass this you're going to need uh, four votes three will not get this passed. 
And if you go and it's not turned down, you are going to be shut down for, for a, a leave a period of two years. So you can withdraw right now and think if, if you want to uh, approach this in a different way, file another variance or um, um, special permit. But we leave that option open for you to uh, make a decision before you ask for a vote. Ms. Colo? Yes. Um, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know. Robin, do you think I should just withdraw? And... What, can you just repeat that again, please, for the option? So okay. if she withdraws now, she can come back with another special permit and or variance application? Yes. Okay. But if she's turned down now, she has to wait two years. That's right. And you're asking us on how to do this. And I just got done saying we, we can't do that. There's ways that this could happen, but it's not for us to tell you what to do. Okay. So that's going to be up to the, um, the owner of the property to look at this, how they want to approach this. If you, if, if we have, you have a no vote, which would be a three to two vote, it'll be turned down for, for two years. So you can't reapply or address this for two more years. If you three let it two. go, then three to two or four to one. No, it's going to be three to two, I believe. Oh, okay. All right. It's not four to one. It's, it's a, uh, the only way it would be is if we had four members, but we're we have five, so we have to have a um, two. I believe it's a two-thirds majority is what they call it. It has, no. to, it has to be four to one, correct, Mr. Decker? It has, it has to be a super majority, four right. to one. Right. Withdraw. I think yeah. I think I withdraw at this time. Okay, so you're going to withdraw, and we'll accept it. With, you're going to withdraw without prejudice, correct? Right. We'll accept it without prejudice. So Are moved. The right terminology, Mr. Decker. So moved. So moved. Okay. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? I will second that the uh, applicant's going to withdraw and, and review their options. And, and okay. All right. So we have a withdrawal. Uh, so now we have to take a vote on this. Uh, Mr. Decker, do you vote to accept this withdrawal? Yes. Okay, let me get the paperwork here. Uh, Ms. Felton? Yes. Mr. Sokolowski? Yes, affirmative. I'll accept the withdrawal. Um, I'll go with the yes. And Alex? Yes. Yes. So in a unanimous decision of five to zero, your uh, withdrawal is accepted. And um, hopefully we can see something or you can work something out um, to the best of whatever. Um, Mr. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, can yes. we have a five minute recess, please? Yes, we can. <sighs> Yeah, I know. Am I back on? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Bernie, were we supposed to review minutes and vote? I think we'll do that after we're done with this. Okay. Is that a problem if we wait? I don't know. No, I think we just got to get it done tonight, Bernie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, are we on um, 77 Stillwater Road? Is that correct? Yeah. This is going to be the um, Leo Markowski. Is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Markowski, okay. Thank you. Um, I have to take the roll call here. Uh, Mr. Decker? He's muted. Okay. Uh, Kathy? Present. Um, Adam? Present. Myself is present. Alex? Yes. Um, John Staberski? Absent. Mr. Decker, are you present? Uh, 
I'll go tell him to unmute. <laughs> I've been trying to get him to unmute, but yeah. <laughs> there you go, Bob. Bob I'm here. here. Bob. You're here, Mr. Decker? Yes. Are you participating in this one? I don't think I'm going to. Okay. So you're going to do a... Um, Leave in the room. Yeah. So he's abstaining. No, he's recusing. If he's, he's leaving recusing. The I get those. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. okay. You want to so, mute Mike again? So, and Mr. Potter, you're here. I am. Okay. Thank you. So we have um, five members present, and we'll have to have another um, supermajority, which would be a four vote. I mean, yeah, we'd have to have four votes. Um, three votes would not get you. Um, the application. Okay. Uh, you're looking for an apart, a special permit for construction of a resident in law with so on, so forth, a uh, special permit of a residency. Um, That's correct. Mr. Markowski, would you like to make an opening statement for us, please? Well, yes. Uh, we purchased a conforming lot on 77 uh, Stillwater Road uh, with the intent of uh, having an in-law apartment or accessory apartment. In there, our son uh, is is part owner in this, um, and uh, that would uh, we, we want to downsize, and my wife and I would be moving into that and still whatever. Uh, and uh, we've uh, constructed or we've designed the house so that uh, the main part of the house actually faces Stillwater Road, and then our accessory apartment is on the uh, left side in the back. Uh, so it, it, when you drive up to the front of the dwelling, you would actually see the main house. You wouldn't even know there's an accessory apartment in there. Uh, it would be using the same driveway and we'd be sharing garages. Uh, uh, we've, we've sent the, uh, the plans to uh, 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 Mr. Walden uh, and uh, my architect, uh, Larry Tuttle, is here to answer any questions uh, regarding uh, anything that I can't answer. Larry? Uh, uh, as far as th this is Larry Tuttle, the architect working with the Markowskis, and we have generated a floor plan with their uh, input that uh, conforms to the bylaw as stated in 2244, uh, following the guidelines of uh, subsection A1C, and that the primary residence and uh, in-law apartment are configured so that the uh, in-law apartment is 1,050 square feet, which is below the 1,200 square foot maximum. And it is uh, represented as 28.8% of the total residency structure that is being constructed or proposed. Um, we, in addition to what uh, Leon was saying, that the apartment is contiguous in the structure, uh, separated by a common uh, activity space, as well as the three bay garage. Uh, as he stated, the primary residence fronts the uh, Stillwater uh, lot, and then the in-law apartment is to the rear on a, a L that is connected to the floor plan. All of the house is constructed at a single level for aging in place uh, flexibility and, and access. And I'm ready to field any questions uh, that the, the board may have. Uh, Kathy, questions? Uh, no, so we're calling it's you're calling it an accessory apartment. Is that right? When you, it's, you it's in, law, in law slash accessory apartment. Okay. Alex, question? Um, yeah, I do. So who will be living in the apartment and who will be living in the main residence? Our son, Tim, and his girlfriend will be occupying the main residence. Uh, he is an owner, one part owner, and my wife and I will be occupying the smaller in-law apartment in the rear. 
So will your son be taking care of you guys yeah. in any way? That's the contention. That's, the contention. That's, right. That's what we're, we're planning on, yeah. My son and his, his girlfriend, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Mr. Potter. Let's hope question. that doesn't happen. We're going to live forever. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> Mr. Potter, question. Uh, yeah, do we have details about whether um, the requirements have been met? The under twenty two forty four, it says that um, uh, the zoning board may issue a special appeal, special permit. Um, provided that the unit meets the standards of the state building code and the following conditions. So the owner life tenant of the bill of the dwelling shall occupy mm -hmm. either of the dwelling units. So that seems to be satisfied. Mm -hmm. um, no more than one accessory apartment that seems to be satisfied. Uh, letter C, uh, maybe the architect can speak to this. The maximum gross floor area of the accessory apartment shall not exceed 30%. Maybe you mentioned that, but I wasn't. He did. Yeah. Yes, okay. uh, it is at 28.8% and uh, the square footage of the accessory unit is 1,050 square feet. Uh, so it is under the 1,200 uh, square foot cap. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think, well, I, think, is it, oh. I think it's interesting to keep going through the whole list. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I was going to do that. Um, uh, the character of the dwelling and the area must be retained. That sounds like we're, we're okay with that. Um, additional floor area complying with the setback requirements. And that, that is, that is Matt. Number of residents not to exceed two people in the accessory apartment. That seems like we're, we're mm -hmm. good there. Yep. Primary year round residents. Yes. Yes. Hey, I have a question uh, when you get a chance, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, go ahead, Mr. Sokolowski. Um, Mr. Decker might be a little bit better at the history lesson here, but I have never had this on new construction. I've never had this request on a new construction, a house that's not built. And they also uh, the also uh, qu other question is, um, is there a hardship and um, what is what is that hardship? Um, and, you know, also the bylaws seem to have expired some time ago. And what is the stance of the town on that where for these accessory apartments? Um, you know, it looks to me like a beautiful two family, one store, uh, two family, one floor house. And, you know, but unfortunately, based on the notes of the building inspector, uh, two family houses are not allowed in residential agricultural. Um, you know, so that's the question, right, Mr. Chair? Correct. The question I have is, is this your primary resident? Do you own any property anywhere else? Uh, well, we do own property in Utah that we visit during the winter for skiing. So this is, back. so you have other properties that you own? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. I, I own commercial, uh, residential or commercial. I own commercial property in Hadley. Oh, but we're, okay. But we're asking about residential. Right. I assume that, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Waldron, comments? Uh, just a comment on what Adam said, and I wish that town council was on, but it does appear as though that bylaw did expire in 2009, which I have not been aware of until last week. But that the last, the last part under enforcement has that paragraph at the end that says this bylaw shall expire. Exactly. In Can you say exactly where you are when you're reading through that? Yeah, if, you, if the page stops. And then you got to go to the next page and flip it over. So I don't, there is no page number, but it's under enforcement, which should be should be deep. So it's right but, above 2250, right above that. Exactly. That last sentence there is the one in question now. And, and the spirit of the accessory apartment bylaw was to allow for elderly folks to stay in their primary and only residence 
and have uh, family members move in to the accessory apartment to keep people in their residence. That was the spirit of the bylaw when it was passed um, at town meeting based on my understanding of the accessory apartment bylaw. But where, where did you where did you get that understanding? <laughs> well, there was a lot of discussion at town meeting when this was taken up. Well, I'm just I'm just looking at the what was written as far as I, the I, yeah, I understand Kathy. But you know, the question is, is it expired? First, I'm not aware of any new construction that was built with a, a quote unquote accessory apartment. I know of of a couple places in town that have in-law accessory apartments. They were additions on existing structures to allow the primary resident to remain in their home. Um, so, like I said, I, I looked at the plans. It looks like a beautiful house. I understand the intent of the Markowskis. I think it's not a bad idea, but I think you're basically allowing a beautiful two-family home in residential agricultural if this was accepted. And I, I think that it's outside of the realm of the accessory apartment um, request. Okay, any other comments? So you think it's outside of the, okay, sorry, it's not a comment, it's more No, go discussion. ahead, go ahead. So, because I was thinking, because uh, we, David was going through all those letters, you know, that to see what requirements had, were being met, and we stopped at I, and we, so we had about four more, and I'm just wondering uh, which one of these isn't met that gives you the impression that it's not an accessory apartment. You know what I'm I saying? He's, I don't think he's arguing that. I I'm, think he's I'm just, I'm okay with that. That one, I'm not. He's, he's arguing it's not an accessory apartment if he's saying he thinks it's a two-family dwelling. Right. That's that's my interpretation of the plan. But I'm just saying that the spirit of the, why the so. The zoning bylaw was set where if you wanted an, an accessory apartment, you had to come to the ZBA, right? So if it was just allowed, if you could just allow a special, uh, allow a, an accessory apartment, then the building inspector could issue that permit. So there has to be special circumstances, and I get it, they have to be met, and at what level they have to be met, and then if, it, if we can still allow it, because it's after 2009, that's why they have to come to this board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I, we, this, like I said, we had they had met all of them eight that we could tell A through H, and we just had four left that we hadn't gone through. Well, um, I'd go like the rest of them. I, I think it's a moot point if I could interject for a second because please, to please. Adam's to Adam's point, we should go back to the very beginning of the description of the accessory yeah. apartment okay. and the purpose. Okay, um, the. Uh, conditions and requirements. The Zoning Board of Appeals may issue a special permit for an accessory apartment in a detached one family dwelling as provided in section 2230. Um, it also says our one uh, in the purpose above that it says uh, one action to facilitate and encourage the creation of living spaces within existing single family dwellings. Yeah. So it's that's, that's where see. the spirit is written. It's not just a spirit from discussion. Yeah, I'm sorry. I wasn't clear. I, I read it over a couple times okay. today. I don't have it no, right in front well, of me. Well, if it's in writing, I feel better about it than just yeah. a feeling from a meeting. So Yeah, and the final four letters of the conditions are really all about sort of access to the Building Commissioner and Board of Health. They're really not about um, okay. the, the actual structure. Well, and plus, what do we do about this expiring in 2009? Well, that's up to the planning board. The planning board, it, you know, they put that in there for a reason and, and and why, I don't know why the expiration is, but when I went over it, I, I noticed it. But um, that's why I think we've never seen this in new construction because the bylaw starts with existing construction. Existing, yeah. Hmm. Okay, any other comments or questions? Do I have a... Uh, um, oh, I'm Bernie, sorry, Jen. There, yeah. there is an attendee that has a question, and I just want to say to the attendee, if it, it's if it's a question pertaining to what they're talking about now, I can promote the attendee. Correct? Yes. All right. If not, put your hand down. 
Oh, okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna allow Lily to talk. Hi, Lily? everybody. The, hi, this is Lily Dwight, um, 45 South Mill River Road. I was the chair of the Senior Housing Committee when we crafted this bylaw. So I thought it might be helpful if I talked a bit about the intent and the 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 challenge was that we as you, many of you know we tried for 10 years to get senior housing in here um and um for a variety of reasons we're, we're unable to and so what we thought was let us do this let us do a trial period with accessory dwelling units because um throughout the nation, it has been shown that these are an excellent way of retaining community and, and retaining families, right? Um, and we had a number of people who wanted it. So I just wanted to step in and say that the, the sunset put on that was because um, we wanted to try it out to see, there were a number of people who were concerned about it and they wanted to see what the effect would be. And that's so we said, okay, well then let's give it a, an end date. And if there are any problems, it will be over. But you are absolutely right. Nobody said, well, if there aren't any problems, what do we do next? So um, it, it just seems to me that as, as someone who actually wrote this bylaw, that what uh, Mr. Markowski is attempting to do is in keeping with the intention behind it. If if that helps at all. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. And I'm happy to answer any questions about the origin of it, if that's helpful. Uh, any other questions? If we're gonna do that, we'll- <laughs> oh, Hold on me. a second, there's one more question. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, John. Hi, this is John Wait. Uh, I'm the chair of the planning board and I just wanted to let you know that this is on our agenda, it has been for about a year or two, is to make this accessory apartment, uh, clarify it a little bit more and actually change it. But Great. we haven't yet, and that's why I'm listening in, because I know you guys get some of these requests, and I'd love to, um, you know, I want to see what the issues are so that we can bring it up to the planning board and, and try to make it more of a, uh, you know, put it into the zoning bylaws so it's clear. And uh, I, I think we're we're on the edge of making it much easier to do accessory to apartments is, is, is I think the direction we're heading. So I just wanted to let you know that. Thanks. So like you're working on it this year, you think? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, if it wasn't for a couple other issues, we would have probably addressed it already. So um, <laughs> I hope in the next 12 months, yes. Okay, any other comments or questions? Do I have a... Uh, motion to end discussion and go into uh, deliberation with the board. Uh, also, one more question. I got to go through this. Um, we have voters on this. We have Kathy, Adam, myself. Uh, we need, that'll give us one, five with Adam and uh, Alex. Mr. Jack is Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step away for a second. Yeah. Uh, Bernie, am I a voter? Yes, you're going to be. We got okay. we got Kathy, got Adam, myself, Adam, and David. So we're going to have five five members, and you're mm -hmm. going to need uh, you're going to need four to vote yes to accept this this supermajority we talked about. And if you do not get it, you're going to have to withdraw for two uh, two years. So make a decision on how you would, how, what you would like to think you would like to do. Well, seeing how the planning board is uh, considering this to extend it, I, I, that's the impression that I got. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, Larry, what do you think? Well, they also have been working on it for an extended period of time, and it's not been... Uh, uh, placed into an enforceable situation and, and it has been expired as, as Adam pointed out. Um, 
I think that the, the certainly the language, the intent when written uh, with the reference to existing structures uh, is a hurdle uh, being a new structure, as he pointed out. The intent and the other requirements of the bylaw of not having it as an income property, uh, not rented by either the uh, uh, apartment uh, dweller or the primary uh, residence dweller, I think is all being met. I think that the, certainly in the spirit of the bylaw, this is, a, uh, con is consistent with the intent. Um, but it is not right now, uh, it's an expired bylaw. And mm -hmm. so it's a question of whether or not you feel that uh, you can get a ruling from the board on this, or you hope and, and lobby with the planning board to get it passed and, and uh, approach it um, in the near future. I mean, you, you've invested quite a bit of time and, and effort in the development of these plans and, and coordinating some of the suppliers and so forth. So, uh, you know, that, that's, it's, it's truly your call, but uh, 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 a, a few months delay in a spring start might be more viable uh, than waiting two years. I think we'll withdraw our application at this point then. Okay. Um, so we can withdraw without prejudice. That's correct. Withdraw, we'll withdraw that. without prejudice. Yeah. Okay. So we have to have a vote on that. Do I have a motion to accept? I'll make withdrawal? a motion to accept Mr. Markowski's withdrawal. Okay. Who is that? Adam. Adam, Mr. Sokolowski. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Mr. Potter, Potter is there a second? Okay. Vote's going to be taken to accept. Uh, Mr. Markowski's withdrawal without prejudice. Ms. Felton. I accept. Uh, Mr. Sokolowski. Yes. And nice to see you, Leon. Yeah, same here, Adam. You're, you're looking good. Sorry we couldn't be more of a help for you, but you got to kind of play by the rules. Well, I, uh, I was the first to build on Gramacki Avenue, uh, uh, 40 years ago, I guess it was, and uh, we, we, we're coming back to South Deerfield. We'd like to. So, okay. All right. uh, Alex? Yes. And Mr. Potter? Yes. Unanimously, five to zero to accept um, their withdrawal without um, prejudice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We want to break for a couple minutes, people. Bathroom break. Up to you. Yeah, let's take a five minute break. Okay, five minutes. <laughs> okay. Five o'clock, we'll meet at five o'clock. For an addition to an existing house from uh, John, and, John and Joanne Carney, special permit or variance, I believe it's special permit. And I believe that it says the, uh, to address the issue of lack of square footage or frontage. And I believe the square footage one is not correct. Well, no, the, the, if I can comment, the frontage is, that's a little questionable because it's on a cul-de-sac. Okay. The square footage is definitely there. I mean, it's, it has 43,000 square feet, and once again, it's in a 60,000 square foot area. So it is an issue with with percentage of coverage. Yeah. And not the frontage, okay. Well, it's just, because it's on a cul-de-sac, that's right. a little different on how you measure it. Okay, first thing we'll do is take attendance. Uh, Mr. Decker? Present. A voting present or a non-voting present? I'm voting. Okay. Um, Ms. Felton? Voting present. Uh, Mr. Sokolowski is going to abstain. I'm going to be present in voting. So we're going to have both uh, alternatives. Alex is present, correct? Yes. And voting? Yes. And 
David Potter. Present. Present and voting. And John Stabersky is present. Are you going to vote on this, John? Yes, I am. Okay, so that gives us. Oh, so one. David is here? I thought David wasn't going to be here. I thought he wasn't going to be here either. Yeah, I'm able. Okay. One, two. Okay, I've got Jaden. Three, three, A. Five. So it's going to be, uh, David is not going to be voting. So it's going to be Bob, Kathy, Myself, Adam, and John. So we have four full-time members, which we have to pick from first, I believe. That's fine. Okay. Um, please stay, David, for this one. In the uh, the next next one. Yeah, I'm gonna tune. I'm gonna be here. I'll be back in for five thirty. Okay. Um, do we have a presentation from representatives from this? And I don't have any paper here from the Carnies. Do we have uh, your yeah. builder present or? Anyone that yes, wants to I, represent you? I have the project manager here, um, who from Scapes Builders uh, in Deerfield, who have uh, designed the project and can uh, ask, uh, answer any questions. Mark Doubleday is his name. Uh, Mr. Doubleday? Yes. Are you here? Yes, I am. Please, please right state here. your name so that we, for the record so we know who we're talking to. Mark Doubleday. And uh, we were proposing to build a 180 square foot uh, four season porch addition uh, in the back of the house. Uh, and the, uh, we were told when we submitted the permit application that it uh, was a non-conforming lot and we needed to file for a special permit or a variance, whichever was applicable. So that's what I did. Okay, questions from anybody? Mr. Decker. Uh, a little more in a history. Corey Rose developed this project back in 1970, 1970s. I think it was probably 1972. Um, the frontage is, at some point in time was measured at a setback line of 30 feet. And I think at the time that this lot was built, it complied with the requirements. And uh, subsequently, the planning board, with the approval of the town meeting, changed the zoning bylaw, but didn't give any protection for those particular houses other than what the statutory protection was. Okay. So, and unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of lots in this town that are non conforming based upon a change that the planning board recommended at the town meeting at that time. It's something that should be changed. And these people, these house lots and what have you, that we're in compliance, uh, it's, they should be able to be brought back into compliance. I just think it makes their properties uh, less marketable. Okay, thank you, Mr. Decker. Anyone else with comments or questions? Alex? Uh, yeah, um, it seems like a small change. Um, to me, it seems fairly straightforward. I understand that it's non-conforming, um, but they're not asking to, you know, um, do 2,000 square feet of uh, change. So um, that's what I got to say. It seems fairly straightforward, but. Kathy, questions? Do we have any information from neighbors or butters? Not that I know of. John? No, I don't, I don't think uh, homeowners should really have to really go through this if they're going to make a reasonable modification to their house. If they're, they're going to rip it down and put on a, up a new house, maybe that's something different. But to build a little deck, that's, that's clearly with foreseeable, a foreseeable improvement. Okay, Mr. Waldron. Well, I mean, I agree with that. It's a very minor thing. Um, I mean, it, but it, if it was just a deck, I would have allowed it. If it was a porch, I would have allowed it. I mean, it is part of the house. So I just need to have a, I'm going to draw my line of sand is when there's a foundation, you know, like if it's, if it's expanding the foundation, then I'm going to deny them. 
based on the fact that it's non-conforming and that's why it's before you to make the decision and and i agree it's very minor um and it's not going to impact the neighborhood at all in, in my opinion but that's why it's before the board so i don't have to make the decisions based on 200 or a thousand feet or you know if, if one neighbor does 200 and the next one asks for a thousand, I don't want to be the one making these decisions. Um, okay. Um, so that's my comment comments? on it. Yeah. Any other comments? I guess it's time for my comment. Um, I'm not in favor of these additions in the fact that we're asking, they're asking for additional space, but this is a little different situation because it is, I believe a porch. Is that correct? Yes, it's going it's to be a porch. porch. So it's going to be something that's going to probably be used partially. Yes. It's more like a deck than it is a porch. Am I correct? Well, it has windows in it because right. it just didn't want uh, screens and it will have a roof. And right. um, the commissioner's correct that it will have a, a foundation. See, that's what it gets to be tricky in the fact that we're. Um, it could become a permanent room. So now we're in a situation of where we draw the line and how many square feet we're gonna be allowed. And once we allow one, then we got issues with someone else coming up and saying, well, I got 200. The next person comes up and they go, well, I got 300. Well, how can we let the guy with 200 go? And I got, uh, I didn't get mine. So well, that's a question. We can make those, that, those decisions on based on the details of each case, right? You so just can. because you decide for one doesn't mean not everybody gets to have it, right? So you can, but you I know can. it gets tricky, but I'm just saying it's I not. know it gets to be tricky, and that's a concern. I, if this did not have a foundation, there's no I would have no problem with it. Would have let it go. No problem if it didn't have a foundation. But is it a full foundation or is it sauna tubes or what is it? It it's a uh, uh we were going to have Paul Corpita do a uh, CMU uh, foundation. I, I'm not a big fan of, of sauna tubes. I, I just don't think they're uh, a good protection against movement and, and frost protection like a, like a CMU block foundation would be. That's why I, I recommended that to the, to the Carnies. Okay. Any other discussion? Do I have a motion to close this informational part of our meeting? No, being, there was no opposition, correct? None that I know of. I'll let the record reflect there's no opposition. Move that we close the hearing. Okay, do I have a second? second. Do I have a second to close? Second. Okay, thank you, John. John closes. Okay, it's time for a vote. All right. Mr. Decker. Yes. Ms. Felton. Are you voting that we're closing the hearing? No, we're closed. We're voting on accept. I'm sorry. I'm, I didn't. I didn't do this right. We're voting on accepting their uh, application for a special permit to put a 180 foot square foot um, addition on their existing house. Bernie, I don't think we voted on closing the hearing. Though. Oh, I thought we did. I thought you voted on closing. The Moved and seconded, but no votes were taken. Okay. I'm sorry. Go back again. Vote to close the discussion. Aye. Yes. Okay. We got? Yes. Five. Unanimous. I'm sorry. No worries. Right. <sighs> um, so let me, let me move to approve the applicant's request for the variance. Okay. Seconded. Second accepted. Okay, so now we're in for a vote. What's the problem is I'm thinking right now, and that's when you get older, it's a little hard to do two things and think at the same time. Maybe that's good. Okay, now we're going to a vote to accept the 180 square feet addition to their existing lot or house. Mr. Decker. Yes. Yes. Ms. Felton. Yes. Uh, Alex. Yes. Mr. Staberski. Yes. Yes. Um, with the reservation, I will vote yes. Unanimous five to zero to allow them to put in a 
180-foot square foot addition on existing uh, house. Thank you very much. Okay. I guess that closes this one. Uh, we're going to reconvene at 5.30. That'll give us a chance to eat. Do I have a motion that we take a little break for a few minutes? Motion. Motion for a recess to oh, thank you. 30. Second. 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 I guess we're going to recess for till 5:30. You got to call it, Bernie. You have to. How, how, all in favor? Oh, all in favor. I yeah, call. Actually, it's a roll call. What? It's a roll call because you're in, on the remote. Oh, okay. Remote call. Remote call. A uh, roll call. Mr. Decker. Yes. Yes. Uh, Alex. Yes. Um, Kathy. Yes. Yes. Um, Alex. Yes. 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 And, and uh, John. I vote yes as well. Okay. All right, so we'll meet back at 5.30. Not board members or the applications or consultants, please. I would appreciate that. Bernie, I'm just, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Did you take attendance yet? I just came back. Yes, in. I did. Mr. Potter, I put you down here. Present, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask people, we're going to do the same procedure, if there's no objection, the way we did it the last time. Mr. Donahue is going to make a statement, and then board members will ask questions, and then the uh, public can uh, make comments. Any objection to that system? Okay. Uh, we ask that the uh, public wait until um, comments by the board are finished, and then we'll recognize you. So the uh, Miss Garnett, no. All right. Well, Jen asked that it's we wait. Janet. <laughs> Janet, wait until we're done to raise your hands. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments before we start? Okay. Yeah, Mr. Sadowski, this yes. Is, we're going with the three-minute rule for again tonight. Um, are we going to try to have Miss Gannett uh, have people not repeat the same things we heard uh, last month? Correct. Um, but we've got a new alarm system that we're going to have. Would you play that, please, so people can hear it? Sure. Hold on, sorry. Can you hear it? Okay, um, I'm also bringing this up. We've got some uh, people that are going to speak for the opposition to this tonight. Um, and we're going to allow them extra time to make their comments. They're going to uh, be representing, uh, I guess, groups of people. So I think it's a, it would be appropriate that we allow them extra time. Uh, people want to uh, do extra comments at the end. We ask that we give everyone a chance to speak, and then we'll go back into more uh, comments at the end. Uh, I don't think the last time we had a problem with running over in comments, people were really good. So let's see if we can continue. Okay, if, with no further ado, uh, Mr. Costa, any questions for us? Are we all set? None for me, not yet. Okay, Mr. Donnie, are we all set? Whenever you are, Mr. Chairman. We are, we're all set. So uh, please give us a presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. For the record, Mark Donahue on behalf of the applicant. Um, uh, let, let me start by thanking, uh, in particular, the chair of the board uh, for the effort in uh, holding the last uh, public hearing, uh, which certainly extended a long period of time. Uh, we appreciate the uh, objective and professional manner in which it was done. Uh, we recognize how difficult uh, your job is as a board of appeals um, in a small town where you have a lot of your neighbors and uh, friends uh, who have very strong opinions that were expressed through the course of that four plus hour public hearing. And I expect you'll hear more this evening, uh, but we trust that the manner in which the board conducted the hearing would be consistent with the way the board will conduct its decision making, which as you committed to when you went on this board was to provide a fair and impartial hearing for the applicant. In reviewing as our development team, our collective notes from the meeting, in fact, reviewing the tape of the last meeting, 
it became clear that the predominant issues that were raised by the public through the course of the uh, evening related to the size of the development and concerns on traffic. Um, and we've provided to the board in writing, um, and it's available as part of your record, uh, a, a correspondence which points out on both of those items some very specific facts from the record uh, that has been assembled as part of your hearing process on both of those points. Uh, facts that as to the size of the development, how it compares to what is required by the zoning bylaw, uh, and as to traffic, as to in particular the peer review work that's been done previously on behalf of the town in evaluating the work that Mr. Kelly did and spoke to particularly. Uh, we see our obligation to answer questions from the board, uh, and therefore we will be directing most of our answers to questions that were raised specifically by the board during the first, uh, during the public hearing that was conducted in August. And what those centered on were questions with regard to traffic and truck movements, particularly on the site and in and around the site, questions with regard to development, uh, and questions as to the physical appearance uh, of, the site, of the proposed development from different venues and different points of uh, review, which we've gone out and created some additional uh, documentation to make part of your record and review this evening. Uh, and so with your permission, Mr. Chairman, I'd like Mr. Kelly first to review uh, some additional information uh, that we have put together to answer the board's questions with regard to traffic concerns uh, that were raised. And as I said, those seem to be focused particularly on the issue of uh, truck or deliveries uh, that might be coming to the site and impacts on surrounding ways as part of that. Uh, but I'll let Mr. Kelly get into more detail with your permission. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dunning, Mr. Kelly. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Again, uh, for the record, Sean Kelly with Benassa Associates. Um, thank you. Um, so if it pleases the board, what I'd like to do is initially present some of the, the new material we have in response to comments we received from the board at the last hearing. And then I'd, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes just touching on some of the general comments that were raised uh, by members of the community as part of the chat room. A lot of these we've already you know, addressed with the board at prior meetings, um, but I think it might make sense to go over those um, briefly. Um, if it's possible to share the screen. Um, Down at the bottom? Yep. So does everyone, does everyone see the, um, the, the DOT plan that we've prepared? Yep. So, so oh. just, just to refresh everyone's memory, you know, the sites on the, the west side of Route 5 and 10, Mill Village Road, North Main Street, intersect to form a four-way intersection to the south. Um, we've been working in concert with MassDOT to put together a plan um, that, that addresses some of the safety concerns at this location that have been, you know, if, quite frankly, for some time. Um, we spent quite a bit of time going over the elements of the plan, but just to refresh us, everyone, again, the, the, the main elements are the, the introduction of left turn lanes, both northbound and southbound on, on 5 and 10 to get to Mill Village Road and North Main Street, as well as the left-hand turn lane into the site. Um, upgrading the signage and the pavement markings to meet current criteria, installation of additional street lighting to, to further improve safety at this location. And then the, really the big change that, that came into play at the last hearing was that we were uh, doing some work to provide you know, bicycle accommodations, paved shoulders along five and 10 within the limits of our project work, which you know, don't exist today to provide um, you know, safe passage for bicyclists, both northbound and southbound on five and 10. At the last meeting, there was uh, some questions raised by the board as to where we stood with regard to MassDOT's review. Um, and we, we did tell the board we'd get back to you on that. We, we did submit this plan to DOT's District uh, 5 office, uh, I'm sorry, District 2 office in Northampton. They have reviewed it and they've come back and told us that you know, they, they're in general agreement with this plan. There may be some fine tuning when they get into the detailed review at the highway access permit um, review process. You know things like shifting of pavement markings or signage, but but in general, the you know the overall plan um, they're in agreement with and it's and they support. Um, with regard to the plan itself, there was also a question at the last meeting as to whether we should be putting a, a crosswalk across Route Five and Ten at this location. Um, we explicitly asked DOT if they would support that measure if it's something they wanted us to um, introduce to the plan and add to this to the plan we've developed to date, um, and, and the answer was no. 
Um, they didn't think this was an appropriate location for a crosswalk, and it's not something that they would support. So that that you know I think is the with the outstanding issues relative to the plan itself. Um, there was some questions, as, as Mark alluded to, about you know truck um, deliveries and, and how we would accommodate um, truck traffic to and from the site. Uh, again, you know, this buildings like this, these Dollar Generals, they don't they don't get a lot of deliveries from larger truck vehicles. Most of the deliveries come via smaller panel trucks, whether that's your you know the Pepsi truck or, or other you know smaller vendors that that you know stock the store. Uh, in the in the larger trucks, the WBs that you see here, you know, those those were once a week type um, arrival, and they're not there frequently. They're not there often. The majority of days you won't have it. Uh, you know, at at, a, at most you'll have it. You know, at one time during the day, and that's typically again once a week. There was some concern um, raised by Mr. Stobierski um, relative to how does that work if the the Pepsi truck arrives, you know, at the same time as the as the, the WB67. And as you can see, you know, the loading area is sufficient to you know, provide. Uh, the ability for both vehicles to unload. This would be a, a very rare occurrence. It's not something we expect is going to happen on a, on a weekly or even probably not even on a monthly basis, but on those infrequent times where the, the truck comes once a week to do their unloading and the, the, someone comes to unload Pepsi, whatever it may be, you know, there's adequate room here for both of the trucks to, to unload at the same time. And again, um, this is not something that we expect to happen frequently at all. It would be, would be quite unfrequently, and, and, uh, but, it, but it can be accommodated. So those were those were really the two I think outstanding items that uh, we wanted to to address tonight. Um, I'm gonna try to get out of the shared screen if I can. Um, can you remove this? I can't remove the shared screen. Uh, there we go. Um, now we did go through the comments that were um, identified by members of the community, and I wanted to touch base on those quickly. I know, again, we you know we've done some detailed presentations to this board relative to the traffic study, relative to the improvements. But just just so everyone's on the same page, you know, there, there were some questions raised as to the the study methodology and, and how it was done, and was it done appropriately? And just want to point out that you know we we did our study in accordance with all state and industry guidelines. We went through a, a thorough review by the town's uh, peer review consultant, Ty and Bond. They reviewed everything from the data collection to the methodology to the you know the trip generation, um, the impacts, the safety, you know, the sight lines. Every aspect of our study was reviewed by by your consultant. And at the end of the day, their their conclusion was that our study was done appropriately. It was done correctly. Uh, they agreed with our findings, particularly with the fact that you know this this site has been designed in such a way to provide safe access and egress for uh, customers as well as all truck activity. Uh, there were some questions in the, in the chat room again about the road safety audit. And again, uh, just to refresh everyone's memory, you know, MassDOT had done a road safety audit at this location a number of years ago, where they identified a number of measures that they felt should be implemented out here to, to improve safety. Uh, none of those measures were implemented and nothing, whether it was increased street lighting or you know, new signage that's not faded, or provision of the left turn lanes, um, you know, widening of the shoulders, wh whatever they were, they, they simply never got done. Um, we had a lot of discussion with MassDOT relative to whether there was a need to do the new RSA, and they ultimately agreed that in, light of, in lieu of doing an RSA, it would make more sense to put those dollars towards the improvements that have been identified that to date have not been put in place. So um, we've, we've had the communication with DOT, they're not asking for another RSA, and, and, we, and quite frankly, we've implemented um, the majority of measures that were in the, the prior RSA for this location. Uh, there was a question about the, the left turn lanes um, that feed onto uh, Mill Village Road, I'm sorry, North Main Street and the site driveway. How many vehicles can stack between those two locations? And it's about 10 vehicles. Uh, the typical queue that we'll see in those turn lanes during peak hours is on the order of one vehicle, possibly two vehicles. Um, there's more than adequate storage within the back-to-back -back lanes to accommodate all the queuing that we expect turning onto both North Main Street and our driveway without any impact in terms of the queues extending into each other. Um, and then the, I think the, the last question that seemed to pop up a bit was regarding the, the bicycle accommodations um, along five and 10 in front of the site. Um, again, under existing conditions, particularly on, on our side of the street, the shoulders that exist today are, are not sufficient to accommodate bike traffic. So bikes have to share the same pavement um, as the vehicles do, which is, is not ideal. It's, it certainly isn't the the current complete streets design criteria. We have you know, updated our plan. We've, we're now showing widening. and It's widening anywhere from 
you know, one feet to five feet on either side of the road to, to provide that, um, that cross section that has a continuous minimum five foot shoulder that's required to accommodate bike traffic in a safe manner. And again, just want to reiterate that this, this is not a condition that exists today. This is a condition that doesn't exist today. And even with the left turn lanes we're proposing, you know, we will be improving the bicycle accommodations uh, along our frontage and along the area we're proposing work. Um, none of this land that we're proposing the widening in is involves any takings or any private properties from the butters or any other, um, you know, private residents or businesses. It's all land that either, you know, we control and quite frankly, it's really all land that's in the, the mass DOT right of way. We've, again, we've, we've presented the plan to DOT, they're in agreement with it and they think it's, it, it makes sense and, and we're committed to working with them to get that, that implemented. I think that that was really the, the gist of you know, what we had to present tonight relative to traffic. I guess actually, I, before I take a step back, there was, there was one more item I wanted to touch base on relative to the truck traffic. Um, I know there has been some discussion um, relative to a site in, in Greenfield where there were some concerns by a, a, a resident opposition relative number of trucks they saw at that facility. And if I can share again, um, I think what I'd like to just point out is, you know, this is, this is the site in, in Greenfield that, you know, has come up in discussion a number of times. Um, as you can see, it, this site is not um, only a Dollar General site. Uh, this site holds Dollar General. It holds an auto parts store. Um, it holds a currently a thrift store, although that was at one point in time a, um, a, a pizza shop, as I understand it. And they also do U-Haul rentals there. Um, and in fact, if you if you look at the site, they they also store tractor trailers in the rear of the site. They, they have a number of them there. Um, and again, they there's there's U-Haul rental activity on this site. So, you know, certainly if if it was a Dollar General store that was a standalone, such as we're proposing you know, we'd expect to see different truck patterns than you would at a facility that houses at least three, if not four different tenants, um, including, you know, a, a trucking facility of U-Haul, as well as, you know, tractor trail storage in the rear of the site. So we do understand we're cognizant of the fact that that was brought up as an issue, but I think this, this site certainly is not um, what we're proposing on this site. We're not going to have tractor trailer storage in the rear. We're not going to have a number of tenants. We're certainly not going to be renting U-Hauls. So I just want to point out that, you know, that we've looked at the site that was brought up, and, it, and it, quite frankly, it's it's kind of an apples to oranges comparison in terms of what we're looking to do at this site. Um, I think that was really all I had for tonight relative to traffic. I'll, if, if, unless the board has any specific questions you'd like me to address now, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Mark um, to continue our presentation. Thank you. Mr. Chair, may I ask a question? Yeah, yes, uh, recognizes Mrs. Taberski for a question. I brought up the topic of uh, safety of bike transportation or bike uh, usage in that area. Um, as I noted at one hearing, I believe uh, the crossway from North Main Street onto Mill Village Road is part of the county's 2009 bikeway pass. It's actually a bikeway, designated bikeway path by the county. Um, and had any thought or consideration been given to the plan to make crossing of five and ten uh, safer for for bicyclists as opposed to the ones going along five and ten I mean I I, I, I take good note of, of bike lanes and widening and that's that's appreciated but um, you know I know on route 116 in Sunderland we've had some deaths and it's a kind of a similar road by the apartments where people will cross a busy road uh, you know I and I've crossed that myself on bikes and it's 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 tricky really tricky with the speed of traffic and and all that any uh any safety well, well, well i think that i think the improvements that certainly you know the, mr the, kelly please re, you have to re, you have to give me your name so that because we have people that are on okay. oh absolutely I'm, i apologize mr okay. chair um, again sean kelly with the nas i mean i i think the improvements that we're putting out there are certainly going to make things safer for bicycle traffic in general um the additional lighting the additional signage the, the, the better delineation of pavement markings and again the provision of the bike lanes with respect to actually crossing five and ten i mean i, I hear what you're saying and, and certainly if, if there was a you know a dedicated push button that would stop traffic on five and ten you know it would be you know an, an improvement um but we we ran that up the flagpole with dot and it's it's not something they support so you know, the, as far as crossing five and 10, the condition is gonna be very similar to what it is today, albeit at a, a more improved intersection with regard to, you know, meeting current design standards, 
better lighting, better pavement markings. You'll you have a better idea as to is the vehicle coming towards me, turning left onto Main, North Main or Mill Village, or is it going straight because the lanes are delineated. Um, the shoulders will again will be wider so that for those vehicles making those moves, you'll have a, a safer refuge area before you make the crossing. So it will be safer for bicyclists, but as far as an actual you know, dedicated um, way to stop traffic to cross five and 10, it's, it's not something that um, DOT is, is currently uh, supporting or in favor of. And do you know why that is? Uh, Mr. Stabersky, remember, please, because we have to, uh, Alex, you have to dictate, you have to write this down, correct, Alex? All right, so if you give us your, your name, we know who you are. Uh, John Stabersky, and I'm, I'm asking why, because I know DOT fought the uh, crossing, uh, pedestrian crossings on 116 in Sunderland, uh, and, and we had a, a several deaths down there. Is there is there a reason why they're not supporting it? I, you know, I, I, I don't want to speak for DOT. That's, that's again, Sean Kelly, we've been asked, I apologize. Um, I don't want to speak for DOT. That's, that's how I'll, I'll get myself in trouble. But, um, you know, there, there were typically a number of factors. It, it may be the, the width of the crossing is, is long, is so long they don't feel it's a safe place to make that maneuver. I mean, there's, uh, we have, a, again, it's, it's basically going to be a, a three-lane section with the left turn lanes and the through lanes. They may feel there's more appropriate locations to make a crossing further north or south. Um, vehicle speeds often is a, is a contributing factor. I'm not sure what the speeds are in Sunderland. If it's a, if the, you know, the, the, the travel speeds are in the 45 mile an hour range as they are out here, that may be a contributing factor, but ultimately, you know, it, it, it's their quarter and they make that decision and, and they've made it clear, you know, very explicitly that they don't support a, a crossing at this intersection. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, board members? Questions, Mr. Decker? No questions. Alex? Nope. Mr. Sokolowski? Okay, I have no questions. All right, Mr. Donahue, would you continue, please, with your presentation? Uh, thank you, Mr. Cha Mr. Chairman, Mark Donahue. Um, the other issue that the board asked us to focus on was to try to give you a better visual understanding of how the proposed building and parking areas would interact with surrounding areas. Uh, we had presented before uh, some computer generated uh, images. You asked for some from some different locations. And so we've gone out and tried to focus on that to try to give you uh, as good a feel as possible. And with your permission, I'm gonna have Mr. Turner from Bowler Engineering review those with you um, and uh, explain what visions he's trying to provide. Mr. Turner, please. Good evening, and for the record, Austin Turner with Bowler. Uh, as, as you recall, at our last discussion- Mr. Turner, please, could you sir. speak up a little bit? Yes, sir. Uh, again, for the Thank record, you. Austin Turner with Bowler. Um, as, as everyone on this, this meeting may recall, there was a substantial amount of discussion at our last meeting revolving around the visualization of the facility, the site improvements, and how that was tying into the greater context of, of the surrounding uses. In consideration of that, we've put together uh, with the project architect and, and the team some additional visualizations that I'll, I'll share my screen and walk you through. Um, we did this at specific locations that were requested during, during that meeting. So the, the first one, when the screen uh, loads up, let, please let me know when you can see that so that I know everybody's looking at the same thing. Everybody see that okay? Yep. Okay. So, yep. The, this this particular view is a, is a recently taken uh, aerial photograph of the site, as you can see. On the right side of my screen is five and ten. Uh, this intersection here, that if you can see my cursor, that's North Main, and then the road that's kind of winding up through the left and center part part of the image is Mill Village Road. The the big white rooftop in the lower left corner, that's the distribution facility. Um, you can see neighbor, neighboring residential uses in the top of the image. And then as you get more in the center right, you can see the proposed retail use uh, positioned on the property. Um, as, as you can also tell, uh, we've, we've taken this photograph recently within the last few weeks or month or so, and it does show the reestablishing vegetation that's located in the state right of way adjacent to five and 10. And this gives you 
some, some pretty good context as to positioning, size, and, and general orientation of, of the use as it relates to some of the surrounding, surrounding neighboring uses. As you can see, the, the right of way for five and 10 is fairly substantial uh, and, the, and the building itself and the improvements are positioned significantly further in, into the property. So it is quite a ways off, off of the, the road. There, there was a request uh, from members of the board for us to provide a visualization as you're going down further down North Main Street, which I'll share here in a momentarily. Also, we've created another one with the team and through the architect at the intersection of five and 10 with some updated photographs that are more representative of, of the existing vegetation along this corridor. And then lastly, we prepared one as you're going further north on five and 10 and looking back at the property. Any questions on this image before I before I go to some more more zoomed in or tighter looks? Uh, I have a question. Could you point out where your retention pond is going to be? Yes, sir. So again, and, and for the record, Austin Turner with Bowler, uh, the stormwater basin is going to be located in this general vicinity over here. If you can see where my cursor is, that's kind of the top right of the image. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. If, if I might, Mark Donahue, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might, while this is up, I would just draw the board's attention uh, to both uh, along the, the rear of the building, the dual methods that have been implemented uh, to screen the proposed development from the abutting residential areas, both the stockade fence, uh, the open area that's going to be preserved uh, by the, the property owner, uh, and then the vet, uh, the um, landscape area that we discussed and showed some other closer views last time. But I think this depiction gives you an idea of the magnitude uh, and the impact of those screening methodologies. Okay. Uh, hearing nothing, no other, again, Austin Turner with Bowler, hearing no other questions on that, I'll, um, I will advance. So th this view here was taken from the intersection of Mill Village Road in, in 5 and 10. And as requested by the board, it has been updated to be representative of a current photograph taken from this intersection. As you can see, there, there's reestablishing vegetation in the right of way, which provides uh, some pretty substantial screening as this is a very up close shot of the facility. You can, you can see how that vegetation provides a, a substantial amount of buffering to the parking lot and also as well as the, as the building. Comments, questions, board members? Okay, uh, Mr. Okay. Turner, I think you uh, can continue. Next image is looking, um, you're, you're further down North Main Street. Uh, the, the road in the center of the image is five and 10 and Mill Village Road intersection, you can see is kind of left and center. This particular location was selected as I, I believe a member of the board, Mr. Stobierski had asked that the, a, a rendering or a visualization be provided at the uh, approximate location of existing residences along this road as if they were on North Main and looking back. So we've taken a, a recent photo here as well. You can see again that the, uh, the facility is positioned roughly in the center of the screen. You can see the existing vegetation that's there as well, and you can see how that provides some substantial buffering and screening for the property. Questions, anyone? Okay, continue please. And then the other rendering that was prepared was as you're further north on five and 10 at this point and you're, you're across from the existing uh, commercial facility, uh, fossil and dinosaurs. And you can see again, um, looking back towards the property, five and 10 is in the immediate foreground. And you can see the property through, through those established trees. And then again, the established vegetation that's along the front of the property and, and kind of the, what, what you'd be anticipating to be able to see Obviously, the vegetation that's in this is going to continue to grow and establish, but um, this photo was taken very, very recently. Questions? Mr. Chair, may I have yes. a question? This is John Staberski. I see a location of a driveway in that photograph. 
Is that uh, the accurate representation of where the driveway is going to be to the uh, facility? Uh, Austin Turner with Bowler. And yeah, yes, sir, that is an accurate representation. And just to give that some, some further context, as you're looking at the overall image and flipping back to the, the kind of the top down view, you can see that driveway location is depicted here. It, it's, it's generally in a similar location uh, to where the existing curb cut was constructed. And that, that shows it here. And then again, as you go back to the image that we were just looking at, you can see it kind of in the, the left side of the image. No questions, can, can you continue please? Uh, th those, those are the new visualizations that we prepared. And as I'd mentioned previously, those are the ones that were prepared at direct request of this board in response to um, wanting to look at some different vantage points. So th those are the new ones that we prepared. If there are any further questions or, or additional discussion, I'd be happy to, happy to answer that. There are no questions, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Zadowski. This is John Staberski. Yes. Question. Uh, the last hearing, I asked that uh, there be a uh, a three D uh, uh, computer generated model, so you could look from different vantage points and look at different areas. Uh, and I think Mr. Donahue said that you weren't going to provide that. Is that still the the applicant's position? I. I, yes, that's the applicant's position and, you know, kind of in consideration of that question, I, I would suggest that the, the many visualizations that have been prepared thus far and, and, and frankly, the one that we did from the top down provides a very good depiction to provide the board and members of the public a feel as to its relationship <coughs> and size and massing with, with um, the remainder of the existing site features and those that are surrounding it. Mr. Turner, I beg to disagree with you because this one that you're showing now, uh, almost 50% of the screen is with a with the trucking facility. The I, I I'm more interested in the houses and uh, the other locations. While well, you're expanding a little bit, I wanted to see how it fit in with with the houses on the other side of in North Main Street and on the other side of five and ten, and it's kind of even in this depiction, it's kind of hard to see, but I, I understand your position and, 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 uh, and uh, accept it. If, if I might, Mr. Chairman, Mark Donahue, uh, we have provided uh, this depiction uh, to the board in a fashion that is capable of management uh, by board members uh, and uh, assuming that it's posted to the public by public uh, so that the um, orientation can be changed, the magnitude of um, the uh, of the photo can be, or the, the generation can be changed. Uh, and we think this is uh, appropriate and, and provides all the, the appropriate information that the board might need to determine how the building will interact uh, with the surrounding area, uh, both the industrial area uh, to its immediate uh, left, as you see it on the screen, and the residences that are further away. Any further questions? I have to make a comment. I apologize to the members and uh, people that I'm asking you to put your, to say your name when you speak out and I didn't follow my own direction. So, you know, the old story is do as I say or do as I do and don't do as I say. I'm sorry, I apologize that I put my name in there. And I, I'm doing this because poor Alex has to go through this and write out the minutes and I'm glad he's doing it because it's, it's, it's a difficult situation. It really helps him if we have the names of the people and that, that go along with the comments. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, Mr. Donnie, are we all set for another presentation or we covered everything that you want? I, I think those were the, what we took away from the meeting as to the, the uh, information requested by the board um, with regard to the, the general umbrella of size of the development and further, uh, uh, further related to the images that uh, Mr. Turner has provided you, we have provided to you as part of our letter, most recent letter to the board, some of just the statistical information uh, as to the property, uh, which we think is relevant as to your determination um, as to the appropriateness 
Uh, we have pointed out that the minimum lot size in this zoning district is 30,000 square feet. Uh, this lot uh, exceeds that by almost a multiple of three without consideration of the expansive state right of way, which is well de depicted in the uh, visual that you have in front of you right now. Your bylaw does impose a limitation on impervious area. That is both building, driveways, and parking. Uh, your bylaw says in this district you cannot exceed 60% what you see before you. Once again, without consideration of the right-of-way area, uh, represents a 36% cover. Uh, we have provided only the parking as required uh, under the zoning bylaw. We have not overparked the facility in any kind of fashion. Um, and so we think that this is consistent with um, the appropriateness of a commercial zone where the property does lie. I would add for the information of the board that we, and I think we talked about at the last meeting, um, the applicant has filed what's called a request for determination of applicability with the Conservation Commission. And we had the first public hearing with regard to that on August 27th. We have a continued hearing later in September, and it relates to um, the, wet, uh, the existence, the technical existence of wetland uh, uh, species and wetland areas as defined under the Wetlands Protection Act in and around the site, not within the building development that you see there, but more on the periphery in some fashion. That's a technical area. Um, we have our consultant. Uh, the abutters have retained their own consultant. Um, you know, the board is going to retain yet a third consultant uh, moving forward. And so we'll trust that that will work its way through. And we don't really intend to uh, get bogged down in this process on determination of a special permit on any of those technical issues, nor do we expect that you would somehow forego or delay your decision. We will need to follow that through. There will be a determination made ultimately by the commission. Uh, and if it is determined that it exists as wetland areas, then we'll have to comply with the Wetlands Protection Act uh, in that fashion or otherwise seek redress as provided by state law. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Tversky, I have a question for you. You want this 3D, do you think it's that important we have this 3D uh, depiction of this area? Uh, I have seen it in, you know, in my practice where you can, you know, we're looking at, for example, the photograph you see uh, before us, we're looking at it from a bird, bird's eye view above. No one ever sees that except for the birds. Uh, yeah, I'd like to be on the ground floor and I'd like to be able to look and see how the size of this particular structure relates to uh, the condominiums, the residences uh, across the street from it, and the dinosaur business next door to it, the, really the neighborhood that is the, the nuclear neighborhood of that area. Uh, and it's, it, you know, I look at this, the trees are uh, blocking the dinosaur building for the most part. Uh, it doesn't depict the, the houses on North, house on North Main Street that's gonna be looking at this facility. So it's kind of inadequate from my viewpoint to be able to properly evaluate the criteria that the, our, our zoning bylaw requires us to, uh, to look at. So that's why I requested that particular, that, that particular uh, methodology of evaluation. You know, the applicant is, is, is entitled to, just to prefer not to, to do that. I understand it, I accept it, but that's you know, a factor for me as in how I consider the project. If I might, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mark Donahue. Um, it, it, if the board thinks it is worthwhile, we can pull back up the images that were shown at the last public hearing in a part of the record. Um, because many of those were taken at the street level uh, and were computer generated, which is what a 3D model would be, is computer generated, um, and therefore has all of the vagaries as far as that's concerned, um, if the board needs that right now. So um, we, we can either uh, suggest that the board review those as part of the record, or we can take the time and uh, if, give Mr. Uh, Turner an opportunity to queue them up and review them again. Your choice. Mr. Sarovsky, may I? Yes. 
uh, you know, I think we can look at those on our own. And I'm actually quite interested because it really, be, you, it wasn't demonstrated to us how you can uh, manipulate the, whatever you said was kind of an interactive process on uh, the bird's eye view and the other views that you've done. I mean, if you can scope around and, and look, uh, look at the, the building from different vantage points, uh, that that'd be wonderful, but it's but it wasn't shown how that works, um, and that might be sufficient. But uh, you know, I, I it's just really to get a feel for what this building is going to look like in this neighborhood, uh, from what people who live there and who travel by, uh, and who use that area are going to see. That was that's the point of it. I thought the three D imagery, uh, computer generated, uh, would work. But if you have a better solution, great. Uh, I'm all ears. Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, this is awesome. Yes, Thank I was going to ask you, Mr. Turner. You're the audio visual person. Uh, yeah. Bernie Sadowski, the uh, ZBA. Um, Mr. Tur Mr. Turner, could you address that since you're the audio visual person? If you'd like yeah, to. I guess I and mean, again, Austin Turner with Bowler. I, I suppose I'm a civil engineer who is working with you know architectural renderings here. But be that as it may, I think to Mr. Stobierski's point, you know, I, I recall specifically there being discussion of specific and pointed vantage points which were requested. And as, as he just articulated during um, his previous statement, this particular one that we're looking at right now was taken specifically from the intersection that was requested. So this vantage point that we're looking at on your screen is the one that was taken from the residents that are most proximate to the property on North Main Street. If, if there are additional vantage points photographs that you're asking the applicant to take and, and pursue those renderings, certainly we, we can entertain those. Um, I, I would suggest that you know, given that we were looking at the ground level here and, and taking that photograph that this provides a depiction as to what might be expected for somebody on North Main Street in this particular location to be seeing. Um, the reason we had provided, you know, this, this kind of bird's eye view as it was discussed was to give the board and members of the public who are in attendance some context as to the overall, overall you know, general corridor, uh, how it relates to some of the existing commercial and industrial properties, as well as those residential uses, because that, that was specifically requested of us as well. Um, to, to Mr. Donahue's point, the, these models were prepared in a computer using the 3D imagery that's been generated both by the architect, our design drawings, and then those were kind of assembled in, into these particular photographs from very specific vantage points that the board had requested. You know, as you're looking, this one here again is at the intersection of five and 10. And if you were in the road at that intersection, this would, would be the expected view corridor that one would see. And then similarly, um, as, as was recently discussed, from, from the existing you know, fossil and dinosaur shop on five and 10, th this particular vantage point as well. Uh, I don't know that you know, creating some kind of model of this entire corridor in, in three dimensions, one, I don't know that that's practicable or even appropriate, frankly. And I'd, I'd suggest that this, this particular view or in all the views that we've discussed previously provides the board with, with really solid context as to, as to what one might visualize when this facility is constructed. Mr. Chair, may I speak? Yes. With all due respect, Mr. Turner, although I did ask for these two views and suggest those, my first preference was to have kind of a, a holistic view because I, you know I didn't list every place that I'd like to see, but I'd like to see what the con what the people who are living in the condos are going to see uh, from the backside of that building, uh, yeah. as well as people coming. I mean, there's always so many different vantage points, and and, and I'm concerned about uh, those folks and the fact that they're going to look at the rear of that facility. What's it going to look like from the rear? What are they going to see? Um, I, I get that. I see that's the way it, it looks, but it is very little context as to where that is. You know. You can go to somebody's window and what are they going to see? It's, uh, I, you know, you've used these tools. They're all over the place. But um, I, I mean, you, uh, we'll, we'll take what you give us. I, I appreciate the work that you've done. It, it, you know, I, I, I prefer more, but uh, uh, we're accepting what, you, what you've given us. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you will, it's again, Austin yes. McCuller. 
just as a, as a quick point, and, and, and Mr. Stobierski, um, this as a question and not to dispute anything you're saying, but you, you had made, made mention something, what does it look like from somebody's bedroom or bathroom or something? And I suppose that rabbit hole runs, runs very, very deep. And we could ask that question for, for any million of vantage points, right? And I suggest that what the applicant has provided and what we're, we've shared with the board on a, on a number of these different uh, meetings provides that context. I'm not, not disputing what you're saying necessarily, but at the same time, I don't know that any additional vantage points that somebody's bedroom, for example, I think that's unreasonable and perhaps not even in the spirit and intent of, of what the, the board's purview would be in that, that regard. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I'd like to uh, kind of preview the board and see how they feel about it. Uh, my personal, uh, Bernie Sadowski, uh, Chairman, um, the more information we get and the more you cooperate, the, uh, the better it looks and it makes it easier for us to make decisions. And uh, if the board thinks it's necessary, then I think we need to look at it. But I think that's not for me to decide. I think the board has to decide that. But again, the more information we get, the more cooperation, it makes our decisions a little easier to decide what's going on. Uh, am I forcing you to do this? No, uh, but Mr. Taberski has been pretty consistent and he's been asking for this. And if you don't want to provide it, that's fine. But I think we need to have a, a, a quick voice vote of uh, other members if they're comfortable with the views that we have gotten. So I'm gonna ask um, if there's no objection that we're gonna just kind of do a quick voice vote of are people comfortable with the views that we've seen? Um, Mr. Decker. I'm fine. Okay. Um, Mr. Sokolowski. I, I like these better than the last time and I don't think a 3D model on a flat piece of paper out of clay is gonna do anything different for me. Um, I appreciate the, the, when you get these online, you can, John, if you fool around with them, zoom in and zoom out and you can go to um, see that. So, I mean, I think it's, it's more accurate representation than what was provided last week where they put the, the overgrown uh, highway, the fire, you know, mass highway area bushes in. So you, you have, and you know, those are obviously within the last month because uh, you know, you can see the, the work going on there at the gas, the gas line. So, um, you know, I, I'm fine with, with what's been provided. I, I don't think, you know, I, I don't think that a 3d model is going to be, I mean, this picture looks pretty 3D to me. That's hey, where Alex, I'm... comments? Um, I think what's been provided is um, adequate. Um, again, I don't want to undercut uh, John here. Um, I think he does have a valid point. Um, I think it would be helpful just, oh, oh no, I'm not muted. I'm sorry. Um, no, I, I think I'm okay with it. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, David? David, are you okay with what we've seen so far? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess yes. we're, people are happy with it. We're happy with it. Um, Mr. Donnie, you any more comments on this? Oh. <laughs> you all set with that? Uh, with what we're so far with the visual? No comments, believe, extra, uh, any comments extra? Uh, unless there's questions or, or uh, any other comments from the board that we would like to respond to, we don't have anything else as our presentation. Okay. Um, can, can I ask a question? Yes, uh, Alex? Yes, um, I was just wondering, um, the foliage in the uh, mass dot right away, uh, is that gonna remain or is that gonna be manicured or um, something to that effect? I'm not sure if this was already answered, but uh, just. It, it's a fair question. I don't know if Mr. Turner can. Uh, yeah, I can certainly answer it. Mr. Chair, through you, of course, if you don't mind me answering directly. Yes. Uh, again, Austin Turner with Bowler. Uh, to answer your question, the intent of the, is not to maintain the vegetation right away. That's gonna grow as it would grow and there's no intended maintenance to be provided unless DOT sees it fit, but the applicant is not intending to maintain that. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if there are no questions from the board, um, Mr. Decker, you all said that we need a break for a minute. 
about five minutes. Okay. Uh, we, we have to take a break. Uh, can we open it up to uh, comments from the public right now for uh, a few minutes? Would that be okay? Any questions from the public or comments from the public? Yes, we have people that have questions. Okay. Please ask um, direct to the, to the chairman that we keep this in orderly fashion. Um, direct the questions to me if you can, please. Uh, name and street. Um, yeah. And we'll go from there. First question, I guess. <coughs> Hi, this is Mike Mario. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Deerfield for Responsible Development. <clears throat> Just want to confirm that you can hear me okay. Yes, but we can't see you. Not real good. Mike, we can't hear you real good. And you cannot see me? No. Oh, boy. Can you hear me any better now? Better. Michael, are you representing this, this group? Is that what you're doing? Yes, I'm representing Deerfield okay. for Responsible Development. Okay, so you're not gonna be on the three minute uh, rule. Be aware Thank of that. You. Okay, so you're gonna have, we're gonna give you extra time um, to, to speak since you're speaking for a group of people. And uh, I apologize, I dress, for, <laughs> I dress for the occasion, but I'm not seeing what's wrong with my video. But if you can hear me okay, I'll proceed. I think we're all, we're all set. Yep. Okay. I submitted a letter um, earlier this morning, which I presume that you all have, and I don't want to take more time than, than is necessary. I do appreciate the extra time, though. Um, I just want to begin by emphasizing um, that the Deerfield residents obviously have taken this very seriously, and they've conveyed to me how the proceedings have gone so far, and I appreciate that uh, you all as a board have put so much work into this. Um, so just Thank you, and thank you for having me on. Uh, what I'd like to emphasize at the outset, which is on the second page of my letter, uh, and which probably the board understands, so I won't belabor it, uh, is just that the decision on the special permit really is at the sound discretion of the zoning board. Um, the, the term of art is that it's, uh, you can make whatever decision you want, uh, as long as it's not on a, quote, legally untenable ground. It just can't be unreasonable, whimsical, capricious, or arbitrary. Uh, and in the letter uh, on that second page, I cite the two cases just for an example of that, um, that actually indicate that even if all the standards are technically satisfied in your zoning bylaws, it is still at your discretion to decide whether to grant or to deny the special permit. Uh, and as it turns out, the courts tend to provide even more discretion um, when denying a special permit. That's not to say that you must deny the special permit, or that's our position. Uh, it's just to emphasize that you really do have dis um, discretion to decide under the zoning bylaws whether you think that the special permit should be granted or not. Uh, and again, as you know, under section 5320 of the zoning bylaws, the duty of the zoning board is to simply weigh the benefits or the anticipated benefits of the project against the detriments. And our position, of course, is that when you weigh them, it appears that the detriments clearly uh, outweigh any positive impact. Uh, and so there are five categories uh, under 5320 that the board uh, considers. I'm only going to touch on a few of them and quickly because I know that you've uh, addressed all of this previously. Um, but the first one is uh, whether or not there'd be a benefit or a detriment to the quote, social, economic, or community needs of the town in the neighborhood. Uh, and in that regard, you know, there's a, a large degree of subjectivity in this, uh, but our view is that this particular project, um, which is designed to accommodate, uh, as the applicant has said during this hearing, it's designed to accommodate a Dollar General store um, or a Dollar Store generally. So I just want to emphasize that I know that there has been some discussion about this previously. I just want to emphasize that as a board, you all are allowed to consider the type of retail establishment that the applicant intends to occupy the site and what that might mean uh, in terms of the social, economic, and community needs for Deerfield and for the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, and I explain in more detail in the letter um, the, the basis for that, the legal basis, and also the factual basis. Uh, but suffice it to say, our position.
Michael, are you there? I, I am here now. When did I lose you? I just noticed that I was reinvited. Yeah, okay, you're back in. Go ahead. <laughs> How long ago did I lose you? <laughs> you just, just for a couple seconds. Okay. Um, so in the letter, I, I, um, I lay out uh, several of the legal and factual bases uh, for why it's relevant to consider that this particular project intends to have a quote unquote dollar store uh, operate as a retail establishment. And as the board might know, I, I think I cite to only four studies uh, in the letter, but there are countless studies and reports about the detrimental impact that dollar stores have had around the country, wherever they open and operate. Uh, <laughs> we're happy to provide more information on that point at future hearings. I, I have a feeling that you've already heard enough of it. My point to stress to you is only that you get to consider it. Um, it's not against the law for the zoning board to consider the impact of a type of retail establishment on the community. I think part of the point of confusion on that, which I, I try to clarify a little bit, albeit perhaps in clunky legalistic fashion, uh, is that you're not allowed to discriminate against uh, a business because it's not domiciled in Massachusetts or because it's not uh, based in Deerfield. You can't discriminate against out of state retailers, but that doesn't mean you can't take into consideration the type of retail establishment uh, that, wants, that the applicant wants to open at this site. Uh, in other words, you couldn't say we can have a dollar store if it's owned by a Deerfield resident, but not a dollar store if it's owned by a Delaware resident. Um, so you, you get to make that consideration. And I think that the evidence uh, that I cite to in the letter uh, and the evidence that is widely available uh, from studies over the past decade show that dollar stores have a negative detrimental impact on the community when they open. Uh, the next um, factor to be considered is under 5322, uh, which is the site traffic. I really don't want to belabor that too much um, because it sounds like you all have discussed that at length. I would only emphasize, uh, number one, uh, there was a TIAS done uh, and you should take that for what it's worth. Um, but that's not the end all and be all of your consideration about the extent to which the project poses uh, increased risk uh, in the community in terms of the traffic that it would generate. As anybody that's driven along that portion of road knows, it is a historically dangerous uh, portion of road. And the other thing, and I believe this has come up a few times, is we would ask or recommend that the board ask that a study be done that shows the impact of the establishment uh, when school's in session. You know, August is just about the slowest time of the year, traffic wise, retail business wise. Uh, so personally, I think it would be advisable if you had a study that showed what traffic is like in September or October when school is in session. Um, but I'm gonna move on next to um, section 5325, which requires the board to consider the impact that the project might have on the natural environment. Uh, and uh, Kate Bednaz, I believe, is uh, waiting in queue to, to briefly address the board and to answer any questions the board might have afterwards. But she is the expert that Deerfield uh, residents have retained uh, to examine whether or not, number one, uh, the project implicates the Wetlands Protection Act, uh, and number two, the extent to which it causes a detrimental impact on the environment. Um, first of all, as uh, the applicants already stated, this issue is before the Conservation Commission to some degree right now, uh, and they have an RDA pending before it. Uh, and as part of that, um, the applicant, uh, Ms. Bednaz, as well as soon to be a third party peer reviewer, are all gonna have a look at the impact that the site has and whether or not it implicates the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, but the information that uh, we have so far suggests number one, that it, it does impact it, but number two, there are real concerns here, um, concerns about stormwater runoff. And in addition to the uh, information that I supplied the board with, uh, which is Kate's Kate Bednaz's letter to the Conservation Commission, 
Um, the board has also received, which I submitted again today as part of my letter, uh, a letter from Darren Gray, who's a, a Deerfield resident and a, an engineer, who really well documents concerns with the project that uh, could have, or, or that make it look likely that the project would have uh, a detrimental impact on stormwater, um, on water flow from the site uh, down the road, not far down the road, uh, to Bloody Brook. Uh, and those are concerns that aren't just for the Conservation Commission, but that are also for, um, for the Zoning Board of Appeals. And so for you to consider those uh, issues, it seems clear to me that number one, uh, it's worth seeing what happens at the Conservation Commission. It's worth waiting uh, and considering whatever the peer reviewer uh, ends up issuing. Uh, and number two, uh, coordinating with the Conservation Commission to not uh, duplicate efforts and to ask uh, the Conservation Commission or to ask the peer reviewer selected by the Conservation Commission or to select another peer reviewer, which seems perhaps inefficient, um, to make sure that the issues raised by Ms. Bednaz, um, by Mr. Gray, uh, and in the letter, uh, both about the impact on the environment generally, but also the impact on stormwater discharge and water quality in particular, the zoning board wants to, I think, technically needs to have that information in order to be able to render uh, a sound decision under section 5325. Um, whether there's going to be a detrimental impact on the natural environment, it's not just the purview of the Conservation Commission, it's also the purview of this board. And therefore making a decision before having that information would be premature and would make whatever decision this board um, renders or would render without that information, it makes it more susceptible to challenge than if, than if this board waits, here's that evidence, evidence, make sure it knows what impact it's gonna, um, the project would have on water quality and discharge and on bloody work. So uh, I, I think perhaps the most critical thing in my view uh, that the board could do would be to continue the hearings long enough to make sure that the Conservation Commission's Peer reviewer, peer reviewer has time to uh, conduct that study. Uh, and uh, I would ask that this board uh, coordinate with the Conservation Commission so that the peer reviewer uh, doesn't just look at whether or not um, the Wetlands Protection Act is implicated, uh, but also looks at uh, the extent to which flooding would be a concern from um, based on the proposed project. And, and in my letter, I summarize, I, I just take several quotes from Darren Gray. I've actually never communicated with Darren Gray. I've never met him. Um, I, I hope I get to meet him soon. And uh, if he's listening in, um, Darren, I, I appreciate the work that you put into your comments. Uh, I excerpted four quotes um, from Mr. Gray, uh, but I urge you if you haven't to really read Mr. Gray's comments in full because each one of the quotes that I excerpted is supported by his comments and analysis of the flaws of the project. Um, and, you know, Mr. Gray is at a disadvantage. He doesn't have all the information uh, that the developer, that the applicant has. Uh, Ms. Bednaz is at a disadvantage. She does not have all the information that the applicant has. We had requested through the Conservation Commission that the landowner permit Ms. Bednaz entry onto the uh, property uh, in order to study and we were not granted that permission, which is the landowner's right. I don't mean to make a big deal of that, uh, but all the more important that a peer reviewer really takes a good long look at this, uh, provides that information to the Conservation Commission, and then that information also be provided uh, to the Zoning Board. Because even though the Conservation Commission will look at a lot of this, it won't necessarily look at all of it. And the zoning bylaws don't simply permit this board to shop out con consideration of environmental issues to the conservation group, the duty of this board to, to make those considerations as well. Um, that's honestly, most of what I have, I'd be very happy to answer any questions. You, you know, I, I quickly note that um, the residents obviously disagree with the uh, design of the project being um, commensurate with the, uh, with the character of the neighborhood. Uh, and uh, we think that there's not enough evidence to 
So one way or the other, whether there'd be any benefit at all um, fiscally to the town. And, and it's quite possible depending on how things go with other businesses um, and with, with uh, valuations of residential and commercial properties uh, and other issues like flooding that, th that there's either no fi positive fiscal impact whatsoever or that there's a detrimental impact. Uh, so I would stress that more information is better. Uh, if the board is inclined, it, it is your it's at your discretion to request um, an additional traffic study that's not during uh, the month of August, that's during a uh, time when school is in session uh, and when businesses are sort of back to normal, which I can see just, these are odd times as it turns out um, in both of those regards, but that doesn't mean that it's not appropriate for the board to request that information uh, and certainly with regard to the environment. The other thing I just want to add is I had a video that I was all set to share with you, but I have a feeling I can't share that with you because I haven't been able to. Oh, are you by chance able to see me now? Yep, we can see you. Now we can I see you. Oversold my preparation otherwise for the beginning. Um, there's a very short under one minute video that I'd love to be able to show um, to the board which is uh, of the right of way uh, in between uh, the dinosaur shop and the project site. And it shows on a day, uh, not a hurricane, um, not a five year, 20 year storm, but on a day when there's some rainfall uh, in Deerfield, uh, the amount of uh, accumulation of water uh, just from a relatively moderate amount of rain. And it really just kind of goes to underscore uh, the risk of feeding into Bloody Brook and causing uh, downstream flooding that is absolutely positively within the discretion of the board to consider when, when rendering this decision. Um, I am going to try sharing a screen. Yeah, that goes. Are you able to see that? Yeah. You can see from the water that this is not a torrential downpour. It is raining um, mildly to heavily, but not very heavily. Um, I'm just going to play it twice. You can get a sense of where it is from the video. Uh, and, and if I'm not mistaken, somebody might correct me if I get this wrong, but you can see the blue sign here. I, I believe that this is between the dino shop and the project site. Um, and all that water accumulates and then it feeds into the culvert that goes straight to Bloody Brook. Um, and this was confirmed by the state, uh, which was an email referred to in the letter and included in Ms. Bednaz's letter that I attached with my letter that I submitted to the board. Um, and so this water feeds into the culvert. Uh, there are legitimate reasons, uh, largely identified by Mr. Gray, um, and, and you've got that, uh, Mr. Gray's comments uh, from Mr. Gray directly, and then I included them with my letter as part of the same PDF with my letter just for convenience. Uh, if the project site exacerbates stormwater discharge, uh, I mean, in a lot of communities, that's enough in and of itself to persuade a board to deny uh, a special permit. So it is, I think at the very least, you want to make sure that uh, whether it's a peer reviewer that is retained by this board or whether it's the peer reviewer retained by the Conservation Commission, that that peer reviewer uh, addresses those issues. Um, and then, uh, forgive me, I'm not certain if Ms. Bednaz is, um, is still on. I know she had a conflict, but if she is on, uh, she'll have a few short words to share with you and then you might have questions for her uh, as this is more you know, her area of expertise than my own. Uh, but thank you and that's all I have for now. All right, we're going to take a, a five-minute break. I need a five-minute break. You know how what I'm talking Bernie, about, Mr. Decker? Bernie. Yes. Uh, Mr. Sokolowski, is the gentleman that just gave the uh, presentation going to be available after the break? Because I have a question for him. Yes. Yes. Like I said, I, I have, I've got to take a break right now, or we're going to have right, a lot we'll of problems. <laughs> so just bear with me for five minutes. I'll be you right back. It. You got it. Break time. <laughs> Who else is back? Oh, John's not back. All right.
John's back. Um, David, you're back? Yes. Adam, you're back? No? Not yet? Yeah, I'm back. Okay. And Mr. Decker? We're waiting for Bob Decker. Bernie, just so you know, we have 58 participants. Okay. Michael, I had just had a quick um, Bernie Sadowski from uh, uh, ZB. I had a chance to look some of these over and uh, some interesting reading in here from a little different perspective. So, so thank you for uh, giving us this to look at. Thank you. I, I appreciate feedback. <laughs> When I was at a nonprofit in Boston for a few years, one of the things I worked on was uh, a local ordinance that wanted to help out local businesses that I was very excited about. <laughs> and that's where I first encountered this legally use the Dorrant Commerce Clause. Yeah. We got Mark, is Mark here? Okay, Mr. Decker is back. Mark, are you there? Okay. How about me, Mr. Costa? Oh, you're you're back, Marco. Thank you. And Mr. Costa, are you there? I am. Esqu Mr. Esquire, are you there? I am. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we can continue. I believe we have some questions um, from board members. Mr. Sokolowski. Hey, Bush, we're going to recognize yes, you. Yes, Mr. Uh, Alo. Yeah, it's Alio, but Alio. All right. Uh, so my question is, um, if Dollar General isn't fitting for that site, it's not responsible development in your opinion, what would be uh, responsible development on that site? Well, that's a good question. And it's possible to some degree I'm stumped. I, I haven't given a lot of consideration to other uh, alternatives, but there are 
um, even national chains that are smaller, um, and I don't just mean size, but they have smaller impacts on the local community than uh, dollar stores per se. Uh, and so like, whether it's a convenience store um, or uh, a retail shop with a specific focus, there are lots of uh, retail shops that you encounter in Northampton. I can you know, list off any number, whether it's an athletic shop, if it's uh, just a sort of generic but small convenience store, um, a boat and boutique. There are all sorts of retail shops uh, that uh, have been studied, and again, including national chains of retail shops uh, that don't have the same types of detrimental impacts uh, that these dollar stores have. And uh, forgive me, I, I, I'm not quite the expert enough to explain to you the difference, except that uh, the dollar stores, uh, they have some combination of um, enough of a wide variety of products uh, at a price point that's very difficult to compete with, um, that, uh, but, but not necessarily a selection of high quality products uh, that's enough to put other businesses under uh, and not enough to serve the needs of the community. Uh, and, you know, in the beginning, it was progressive circles would complain about, um, I'll just be honest, we complain about any national shop. We favored local re retailers. So that was, you know, decades ago. And the, the more experience we've had with different types of national retailers, the more evidence there is. And it's not just, uh, you know, progressive left-wing uh, anti-business, uh, you know, studies and, uh, and outlets that have reported these findings. It, it's become a matter of major concern that sort of uh, transgresses um, political affiliation. And it doesn't mean that there's not some benefit provided by a dollar store, but, you know, because people shop there. And, and obviously if people shop there, that means that there's something that people want to get there, but that the net benefit, uh, and sometimes it takes a few years to, to discover, tends to be uh, quite negative. Uh, and that's what uh, the studies that I referred to in the letter, and honestly, I you know, weeded out probably another 15 uh, articles that both include statistics and anecdotes to that effect um, that, that go in more detail. And it so might I, just want, I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm hearing you correctly, Counselor, and that stance for the people that you represent is that the law is in fact developable, but the dollar general in and of itself would be detrimental to the community and doesn't fit the guidelines set forth. That's exactly my position. And, okay. and, 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 and the reason being in part, uh, you know, in some ways it's easier to identify the environmental concerns it's not that it's a retail store alone, you know, it's larger than the residents would like, independent of it being a Dollar General store, but a Dollar General store of that size, as far as we understand, is bound to have a detrimental impact on the community. And the only other point I'd make, which perhaps I've made enough, is you get to consider that, you know, the applicant has disclosed that this is designed for a Dollar General, um, and it's publicly known that the project site is, or that the project is, intends to. You have answered my question. Yeah. If I could, one I mean, other thing. Sir, sorry. I mean, Adam, sir, I mean, there's 58 people, I believe, waiting to, to speak. And it's seven, you know, you've answered my question specifically. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And the, the only other thing I'd add, I, I think I, I neglected to add it before, is. Um, among the, the individuals that I represent as part of the Deerfield for Responsible Development are several abutters. And, and so this hits home all the more to them. But on that note, I, I, I will stop speaking in the same Okay, uh, we need to move on. We got, what, 58? Jen, 59? Mr. Scott. Well, there's, there's uh, 59. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, John, you have a question? Yes, I would like to ask uh, Attorney Costa a, a question. That, uh, that goes back to a question I asked at our last session. Attorney Leo just uh, raised the issue of whether you could con consider uh, the detrimental effects of a dollar general on our community. Uh, 
Do you agree with his opinion? Because it seems to be different what than what you told us at our last meeting. Through you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, so uh, Adam Costa, Town Council. So to your question, I, I agree, but in a somewhat nuanced way. So I think that it's a slippery slope and, and I'll, I'll give credit to Attorney Leo in terms of how he phrased what he said. He, he indicated, and I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but it's, it's what, what I recall. He indicated that what you could consider was the type of retail establishment. And I think that using that terminology, the type of retail establishment might be a little different than saying you can consider that it's a dollar general. I, I have a fear and I'm cautious in advising boards that I represent to place any weight really on the identity of the applicant. Uh, the applicant being a dollar general store. Um, I might even go so far as to say the applicant being a dollar store. Uh, and I don't mean capital D, capital S, I mean a, a store that proceeds in accordance with that model, a dollar store. Um, I, I would agree with Attorney Leo that you can consider um, the nature of the operation. So the fact that as Attorney Donahue had characterized it a bit earlier tonight, what you've got here, and, and maybe, maybe he characterized it this way in his correspondence that I reviewed earlier today, but uh, either, either tonight or in that correspondence, he referred to the, the operation, the, the business as um, a, a bit of everything. They, they offer a variety of different um, types of goods and I think it was a letter that said that's unlike anything else that is offered in Deerfield. And that maybe is to be debated. I'm not, I'm not lending any credence to that statement, but that was a statement that was made. So I think that the board can certainly consider the type of establishment when applying the standards of, of your zoning bylaw, which, can, which include, for example, economic and community needs, social, economic, and community needs served by the proposal. We talked a bit about that at the last session of the public hearing. So. Certainly, I think that's an appropriate consideration. I do have a real concern with the board considering, well, it's a dollar general. We've heard things about dollar general and based upon a reputation that precedes it, we are going to deny the special permit. I have a concern with that sort of rationale, but that's not to say that I'm advising the board that it can't consider the nature of the operation and how that would impact um, the the uh, local economy, the needs of the community, and also all of the other factors, the traffic flow that might be associated with this sort of a use versus a, a different type of commercial establishment, or that this sort of a commercial establishment versus another is consistent or could be consistent with the, the character of the neighborhood. Those are appropriate considerations. Those fall in line with the standards in Section 5320 of the bylaw. Thank you. If I could just say ever so briefly, this is Michael Alio. Could I say something for 30 seconds, Chair? Briefly, we have a lot of people waiting. Briefly, please. Yeah, the focus really is not on the identity of this being Dollar General with a capital D, capital G, but on this being a dollar store with a lowercase d, lowercase s. And my position is that you get to consider that. Um, and studies bear out that dollar stores are different not because it's a Dollar General as a proper name, but because of the type of establishment that, that it is. So, thank you. Uh, Chair, uh, uh, I have a question for you, since uh, Chairman. So in other words, you're, you're valuing what they sell is, is uh, you're making a judgment on what they sell as being what? It's, um, it's, to some degree, a, are you making a value judgment of this? It, it is a value judgment to some degree. It's it's the business model for- Okay, and you've answered my question. Thank you very much, you've answered my question. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next- um, May I just briefly, Mr. Chairman? Oh, yes. I, 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 I think it's important to understand two things. Um, retail sales is a general term used in your zoning bylaw. This is Mark Donahue. Uh, pardon me, I'm, my apologies. Um, it, and that's what is allowed and what requires a special permit is the size of it. What we have described as opposed to a brand name um, is a store that sells a variety of goods. It sells kitchen goods, household cleaning goods, gifts, toys, you know, 
a, a whole range of food products uh, and those type of things. The, the brand that's been identified to date uh, for the use of the facility is not a dollar store in that Dollar General's current business model is not just to sell items for a dollar. In fact, a Dollar General store is much more equivalent to a pharmacy without drugs, uh, a variety of goods at a variety of different price points. But what's more important is that the reality of retail, particularly now in where we stand, is that this building will last longer than whether it's Dollar General or any other tenant. And another retail type of operation will come into that space. And they will comply with your bylaw. And if your bylaw defines different types of retail differently, then they'll have to comply with that. If you continue to use the general term of retail, then they will meet that. Uh, and I think this focus on what a dollar store is and all the inappropriate things that come with that assertion as far as what type of people shop there and everything is totally misfounded and misappropriated. I also want to make one other point um, with regard to this whole environmental stuff. Um, we're trying to take the issue off the table by going to the Conservation Commission with regard to the wetland issues. And we purposely haven't tried to bring all of that here for you determine for your determination. What we see the whole permitting process is really a three level process. Your job is to decide generally is the use, which is a specially permitted use, acceptable for the town under the standards of your bylaw? If you say it is, then we then have to go to the planning board for site plan approval, which focuses on a number of the nitty gritty details, such as specific lighting issues, landscaping issues, stormwater issues, and the like. And if we trigger and if the land does have any wetland resource areas on it, then it's the obligation of the applicant to convince the Conservation Commission by a preponderance of the evidence that the work proposed on the site can be done in a fashion that adequately protects the wetlands or we won't be able to be allowed to do it. Mr. Aleo's effort to try to conflate this all into one hearing is nothing but more than an effort to try to slow the process down. Um, you have a specific job to do that is regardless of whether there are wetlands on the site or not. That's gonna be determined by another board with, more credit, with, with much more specificity, more experience, and with the resources available to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Donahue. Uh, can we move on to the other people that have, we have probably have 100 people now. Oh, well. Not everybody's asking a question, but all right, okay. I'm going to, Michael, I'm going to put you back over there. Bye. Oh, I'm sorry, does anyone else on the board have a question? I shut everybody off. I shouldn't do that. I'm sorry. I apologize. Anyone else? Okay, so let's go back. Let's go to the public comments, please. Susan? Yes, my name is Susan Half. I'm in a butter. And I would like to say that, first of all, I agree with Attorney Alio's uh, presentation. I do have a couple of points I want to make. One is a personal point uh, on my part, and that is something that uh, the attorney for the applicant said last, at the last meeting. They knew what they were getting. Uh, unfortunately, apparently that person has never dealt with a real estate agent who is trying to sell a house. When you're in, you're looking at a house that's in a generally agricultural area and there's an ag agricultural field across the street, the real estate agent does not say, oh, by the way, that lot is zoned uh, commercial and you may have a, you may have a business in there. No, they don't say that. We did not know what we were getting into. But then uh, my other point is the applicant emphasizes the Route 5 corridor and he's really not interested in the slightest bit in either the town of Deerfield or the neighborhood. The neighborhood gets mentioned 
only in passing uh, if, if forced to. They have always emphasized traffic passing by, unquote, the corridor. But they don't say anything about what is, what's going to happen to the people who look across the street at this structure. The pictures we saw today were very clear. The one taken from North Main Street at uh, to uh, Route 5 and 10 and across to Mill Village. You think of the contours of the land, those of us who live here know that. That picture was taken from a low point looking up at the, 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 the structure and Mill Village. When you get on Mill Village and you get to where people live, You've gone up a slight grade. It's not a mountain, but you've gone up a grade. And our view will be from higher than that picture indicated. And there was no, no picture. There was one little drawing of fake trees, but there is no picture of what we are going to be treated with every morning when we get up. I thank you very much for your patience and for your, <laughs> your hanging in there with this. Uh, we as the town appreciate what you're doing. Um, we pay taxes here. We're vitally interested in the, not just our own little area, but we're interested in the whole town. We come to town meeting we are Deerfield. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, Jen? Uh, point of order, Mr. Oh, Chairman. Yes, uh, Mr. Stabarski. Uh, we couldn't see Susan Haff's image. I, I don't know if she didn't have her video on or if that's something from uh, our side in Deerfield, but it'd be it's good. It's not from our side. Okay, it, for, so for folks who, sp who are speaking, It'd be good to make sure your video's turned on when you speak. And it'd be good maybe to confirm that so so we all can see you as well. Thank you. Know where it is. Okay, uh, Jen? Okay, so this is John, wait. John? You have to turn your camera on. Uh, just gonna allow me. Have well, mostly you want to hear my voice, I think. Oh, we want to see your beautiful face. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, do you have to give me permission to put the camera on? No. Eh, it's not coming out here. Uh, maybe. It is. So I just wanted to make, so I'm John Waite. I live at 15 uh, Keats Road. I'll look for the camera thing in the meantime. Um, and I, I'll also uh, say that I'm the chair of the Deerfield Planning Board. But my first comment actually was just an observation about the visual that you guys were looking at earlier and that you were referred to as a bird's eye view. I pulled up Google Earth while I was looking at that and the visual that you guys were looking at seemed to be at an angle. So it appeared like the warehouse was a lot bigger than the houses and the other buildings behind it. Whereas if you do a, a Google Earth and you look straight down on it, you know, the, the warehouse looks a little smaller, the houses look a little bigger which, uh, so I, I don't know if Austin um, did, did that on purpose or not, but I think it's, it's better to do a, if you're gonna do a bird's eye, you should get a real bird's eye view. Um, but my other comment is um, that the planning board did have five public hearings uh, almost two years ago, and the planning board denied their site plan review on December 10th, 2018. And I just wanna make people aware that we have received a, a uh, what we call a remand order um, which means they're gonna, it's, this uh, project is coming back for another look at a site plan review. And we're hoping to schedule the public hearing on October 5th. So I want uh, both the zoning board and the public to know that the planning board appear, uh, apparently will have another public hearing on it. And again, that's for the site plan review. We look at a lot of the technical things. Um, Mr. Donahue just went over that, that you know, we'll, we've had uh, people look at the traffic and the, the stormwater and some other issues. But what we don't 
have is what the instructions that um, for the zoning board. So the zoning board has uh, a public, a uh, special permit is different than what we do for a special permit. So the, the, I mean, the special permit is different than what we do for the site plan review. The special permit really looks at do the benefits outweigh the detriments. So I just wanna really put that, that's your charge. And then next month, we'll look at more of the technical issues. Conservation Commission looks at their issues. And the benefits, um, do they outweigh the detriments? So I, I just wanna, I've been listening to a lot of these meetings. I haven't heard a lot of the benefits. So I just wanted to sort of see if you could, uh, maybe we can focus a, a little more on that because it's not whether they meet, you know, whether the truck can turn in the parking lot or not. It's, it's really whether this whole uh, development and the reason why it's looking for a special permit is because it's more than 4,000 square feet. So our zoning bylaws says if it's 4,000 or less, you know, it's, it's, uh, they can do it in the commercial. This is more than twice that, so it, it comes to you. So it's a big responsibility for you guys. I appreciate all your hard work. And, and I hope you really um, try, to, try to focus on, on do the benefits. Apparently when we did the bylaws, we didn't think it was appropriate for a building of, of more than 4,000 square feet. And that bylaw has been here for a while now. We haven't changed it. And I think we didn't change it because we, we, we thought it was more appropriate for a building of 4,000 square feet or less to be there. Thank you, John. Um, thanks very much. Thank you, John. Uh, next comment. I have a question for Mr. Waite. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Bernie, Chair, can I proceed with my question? Yes, I'm Someone? sorry, Adam, go ahead. So if John could just explain for people that what that means, it, does it, and I'm not, uh, the remand means that the planning board voted unlawfully to deny it, and that decision was overturned? Or does it mean, what, what does that mean? Because I don't know what it means. Remand, it means you're going to hear it again, but, but why? Can you explain why? I can, uh, I can give my uh, assessment of it, and then we do have attorney Costa here to help us with it. So that, they uh, apparently, I'm not sure if the language is they appealed it, um, they're coming back with a new or some revisions to the site plan that we looked at. So I think the site plan that you're looking at is the revised one. We haven't seen all of the, it hasn't been in front of us uh, for a public hearing with all the revisions. We're not sure what our decision will be. Uh, Adam, is that a fair assessment? It's just if I could through you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. So uh, again, Adam Cost, the town council. So I, I think that's generally correct. So um, just to provide a bit of background, the, the, the planning board, as uh, Chairman Waite had indicated, conducted a series of public hearings. I, I can't say that I had a, a role in those public hearings, but I'm aware that they occurred. And as a consequence of those public hearings and at the conclusion of the public hearing, the board voted to deny site plan approval and to deny a stormwater permit. Uh, Dollar General then appealed those denials to the land court. Uh, we, we began litigating the case, and shortly uh, thereafter, we engaged in, in discussions about whether there was a, a potential resolution that could be had. Um, I, I do want to say to the board, and I'm, I'm not disclosing company secrets here because this is something that anybody could learn by doing a bit of research into site plan review, that site plan review is not the same sort of discretionary tool that a special permit is. And so site plan review is only denied in very rare instances. And that's uh, something that I discussed with, with representatives of the planning board after the litigation ensued. Uh, I, I wanna say that I think that that, maybe together with some other things, prompted the board to uh, consider uh, having discussions with the applicant about a resolution about the issues it had with the plan that caused the planning board to deny the project. And long story short, we had a couple of meetings in the winter of 2019 into 2020, um, just before the first of the year, um, or just after the first of the year. And uh, as a consequence of those meetings, which were with Dollar General representatives, as well as with the representatives of the planning board, there was a joint motion that was submitted to the land court asking for a remand to the planning board. So it wasn't that the, excuse me, yes, the remand to the planning board from the land court. It wasn't that the land court decided anything. There was no decision rendered. We never got to the merits of the case. Rather, the parties entered into discussions, settlement discussions. And as a consequence of, the, of those discussions, the parties, the planning board through its representatives, 
and Dollar General through its representatives agreed to submit a joint request to the land court that the matter be remanded. And we, due to COVID-19, that process was delayed by several months. The courts were closed. But we received just a couple of weeks ago the remand order from the court. And as uh, Chairman Wade has indicated, uh, we are in the process of selecting a date for that remand hearing uh, before, the, before the planning board for the board to consider what was discussed at those uh, settlement meetings, which are, uh, is a revised project, revisions made in an attempt to address the concerns of the planning board. Uh, the remand is being done in anticipation of a more favorable outcome, but certainly until the, until the public hearing is conducted, there are no guarantees. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Mr. Costa and Mr. Waite. Uh, any other questions? Okay, Jen, next person, please. Jen? Yep, one second, sorry. Okay. Okay, Leo? Uh, Len, Len, Len. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Keep it on me. Uh, for, I just want to tell you guys that something on your end is keeping us from having our video because we, we don't, you know, I've done many, many Zoom meetings. I have, usually have a video on off button. I don't have a video on off button. It seems like nobody else does either. I don't think it's that important. Uh, I'm not that beautiful. Uh, but I just want to let you know, it's not, we don't, it's not because we don't know how to do it. Well, I but don't know. Anyway, sure. Well, I was just wondering how Michael did it because I didn't change any settings or anything. So it's, I went through all of the settings while you guys were talking and I can't find that. So it's, there's no setting that says turn off um, attendees cameras when they become panelists. So I've, but somehow, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. I, I, I don't know, you know, just having done many Zooms, there's always a camera icon and you can turn it on or off and it's not there. Uh, anyway, I have, just a number of concerns. Um, so Jen? There he is. He's there. Well, we can't hear anything. If we can't hear from him, we're going to move on to the next person. Let him come back okay. later. I'm we, are, we got a time there frame we're working on here. Um, unfortunately, okay. that's what we're doing. Okay, go for it. Go for it. Oh, okay. All right, number one, the hours of the store are 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. I'm very concerned. That's very different than anything else that goes on in that neighborhood. Uh, the stores in that neighborhood um, close at, I don't know, six or maybe seven. But they don't stay up until 10. I think that that's going to impact. Having a store up until 10 will impact on the uh, butters, uh, the people who live right behind that store. That hasn't been discussed at all. I just want to bring it, just want to remind the planning board that that's, that's uh, a factor. Also, um, I'm concerned, I'm going to ask Mr. Costa, if the, if the, if this is a, if the uh, special permit is granted, does that become a precedent for any store of this size that wants to go in, uh, in that, in on Route 5 and 10 in, in Deerfield? Mr. Costa? Would you like me to respond to that, Mr. Yes, Chair? Yes, please. Um, so uh, I, I can answer that question legally, and I can answer that question practically. So legally, it's well established that municipal bodies, boards, commissions, committees are not precedent setting. So there is, there is ample case law that says the fact that a board has acted a certain way once, twice, three times doesn't obligate it legally to act the same way the fourth, fifth, or sixth time. That said, I often advise the boards that I represent that there is something to be said for consistency. Um, it provides uh, applicants with uh, appropriate expectations. Um, it, it provides, it, it lends support to this, this, the decision-making process. So I certainly advocate for consistency, at least in terms of how the standards, for example, in a bylaw are applied. Of course, very often different projects, even within along the same roadway or the same stretch of a roadway, can be differentiated based upon what they offer the community or what detriments they may, uh, they may have to a community or to a neighborhood. And so every project is different. There is no precedent setting legally, but certainly there's something to be said for being consistent as best, as best the board can be. Well, thank you for explaining that. Um, 
just in terms of the traffic of the, this is a question for somebody from um, the developer. I've looked at, I've looked through documents and there's a lot of documents about traffic and other things posted on the town website. When you discussed this with the state and you uh, explained all those discussions, did the state produce any document like uh, just um, from their point of view, stating what the, what the, how things might be dealt with and what the issues are? I don't know if the state ever does that. We've only heard from you know, the developer about what the state's positions are on the various traffic uh, aspects. But it particularly concerns me that uh, the traffic study or well, the data was used from a, a site that is a few miles away from the intersection. And I'm still not clear, other than hearing about left turn lanes, how the intersection impacts on the overall safety of uh, the, the proposal, the proposed uh, driveway and the traffic there, which is very close to the intersection. You know, I sat at, the, as you may know, I sat at the intersection a couple of times and uh, on a Friday afternoon, there were hundreds of cars several hundred cars per hour that, cross, that enter and exit from that intersection. So that's in addition to the um, 9,000 cars a day that, that is um, typical for the, uh, the, the traffic uh, counter up the road. There's hundreds, there's probably another 4,000 cars a day that enter, enter and exit in the intersection. And I wonder just what is the understanding of how that those cars impact on the safety of this the driveway. That, that really hasn't been addressed, to, in my opinion. And- um, Thank you, your time's up. Do you okay, want to answer that? I, I can address that again. Um, I'm Sean Kelly with Vidas and Associates. So I guess I, two things I want to make clear. Um, in terms of the, the traffic volumes that you had referenced, the collection of the data, we didn't collect data a mile or so up the road or any distance from the site. It was collected right at the site frontage. So the, the data we collected is, is, is specific to the, to the area we're looking at and it was done right in the vicinity of the site. With respect to the state's uh, position on safety, they did issue a report. Again, um, and if you hadn't been uh, present at the prior hearings, the state actually did a report where they identified a, a number, a whole host of measures that were recommended as part of a road safety audit. And, just to give you some background, a road safety audit is basically a study where the, the state brings in uh, people from Mass DOT, safety division, their highway division, the district two office in Northampton. They bring in representatives from the town, from the fire department, the police department, typically a planning department. Um, all of the base of the, the, you know, the, the players that would be looking at and concerned with safety at this location. They did an extensive study which, which involved community feedback and they came up with a host of measures that were identified that were deemed appropriate to improve safety at this location. And, and quite frankly, for a number of years, that report sat on a shelf and none of those measures were implemented. We've been in contact with the state a number of times. We've gone through the measures that were recommended, anything from the replacing signage that's outdated and doesn't meet current standards, adding street lighting to the intersection isn't you know, pitch black at night, adding the turn lanes to facilitate and make safer the movements to and from North Main Street and Middle Village Road. So, you know, we didn't, we didn't develop these measures in a vacuum. These measures were actually developed in concert with both Mass DOT as well as local town um, officials and town departments. And, and Dollar General and our client has taken upon themselves to, to implement these measures because quite frankly, they've been recommended for a number of years now and, that, and those measures are still sitting on a shelf. So it, we, we did do that in concert with the state and the report is available. You know, if you want to go to the state website, it's there. Um, and, and again, the, the volumes we collected are all proximate to the site right there um, at our frontage and at the intersection. Jan, is there a link to that? Oh, no, whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 no. You've had your three minutes, please. You'll have to wait and come back again. We have people waiting. I'm Thank sorry. You. But the next person, please. Hey, Darren. Darren, you have to unmute. Hello, this is Darren. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. I live at 20 Captain Latham Drive, been a resident of South Field since uh, 2001. Is that, oh, let me kill the light. Okay. Um, let's see, I, uh, I'm a certified professional engineer with 20 plus years experience, all um, of it land development, commercial, medical, retail, industrial, oil and gas, currently work with Bay State Health. 
um, for eight years involved. I'm their local expert on all things civil and all things land development. Um, so I'm concerned about this application. So I submitted a technical review memo to the town on the 28th, uh, considered, considered some critical elements of the design related to utilities, stormwater, sanitary. Uh, and also concerned with the precedent this would set if this is passed, um, given the state application, some of the glaring errors. Um, so the subjects in my memo were brought up in the chat in the previous meeting, so applicable. Um, first off, a quick one, I strongly recommend the town contact uh, the state MEPA offices with a phone call and a request for advisory opinion on the applic applicability of the MEPA permitting process. I believe they're gonna wanna hear about this project. And these parcels are map marked as farmland of unique importance and also marked as areas of prime farmland. You can find it on the Oliver GIS system through the state. Uh, the applicant is incurring state permits and these parcels have been hayed or farmed in the past few years. To me that wraps into the NEPA process and given the contentious nature of this, I think they wanna have a look at it. I think it's not a big process to request that with the state and I think that should definitely happen. The septic design fails. Um, it's unquestionable it fails. And in fact, I don't think this parcel can pass. Um, it's got a fatal flaw. We have different uh, dimensional constraints here. One of which is the town does not allow for new construction. You cannot mound the leach field. You cannot raise the grade of that leach field. So you're stuck with where it is. That's as high as you can go the leach component of your septic system. And the test pit, the results were consistent that the depth of seasonal high groundwater was 30 inches. And now the state, the Title V requirements require four foot separation between the bottom of that leach field and seasonal high groundwater. So if you can't bring the system up and your seasonal high is at 30 inches down, they can't achieve this four feet that they're claiming in these drawings. And the drawings aren't thorough. They leave out uh, contour information, the grading information. The grading within the septic designs and also in their stormwater management report is not coordinated within the plan set that was submitted to the city or the town. You, the planning board hasn't seen it. This stuff has not been gone through the full review process. Um, again, to me, it's a fatal flaw. And if they can't fix the septic and get their sanitary working, then I don't know why we're talking about anything anymore in this town with this project. Unless they want to extend the sewer to five and 10. Uh, I don't see how they're going to pull that off otherwise. Um, these drawings weren't stamped or embossed by a professional. Let's see, the perk rates. The perk rates are in the high, they're 51 and 50, 54 minutes per inch. Your perk fails at 60 per inch. So that only reinforces the need for that four foot separation. So if you don't get that four foot separation, your sanitary doesn't digest, it gets into the groundwater, it gets into the brook, it gets into our, into our commonly flooding downtown. I got the bloody brook crosses where I live. It's real, it happens all the time. Um, that requires- Okay, that's the time, sorry. I didn't even get into the stormwater that uh, the attorney talked about. That's got problems too, that neighbors to the north are in danger. Thank you very much for your comments. Mr. Chairman, may I? May I? Yes, you may, Mr. Donahue. Mark Donahue. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad, and, and it's your meeting, you, you can hear comments of any kind you want, but you know, starting to have discussions about a septic plan, when we've submitted to the board the approved Board of Health septic plan is only gonna eat up all of our time and energy. And with all due respect to the last speaker, isn't gonna help the board decide whether to issue a special permit or not. Um, and it's also not the first time we've heard about septic because the reason that you have the Board of Health approval is because septic was talked about on August 13th. And so we went out, we dragged out the information and we submitted it. Um, I, I think there's gotta be some focus on on the public comment here, uh, at least on the subject matter of what the board's here for, or you're gonna be holding four or five additional hearings at this rate without any new information. Thank you. Can I make a comment? I agree with you, but um, I'm only one member. Um, and I think that we're, we asked that they comment on what was presented. And when we get into these areas of wetlands and, and septic issues, I don't think that's our purview that we start looking into that. We're, first of all, we're not experts, number one. And, and number two, they're asking us to look at this stuff, but we have no right to do that. That is up to this, the other boards. And I don't want to cut people off, but I'm only one person and I, we want to hear from people. But, but I agree with you. If we start going into uh, you know, birds and everything else, we could, we could be here for forever and a day. 
And what does that amount to? A filibuster? Is that what we're looking at? And I, I don't like to see a filibuster. So well, if we're I'll be glad to cut them off. If, okay. if you need somebody to do it, I'll step up. Well, I want to check with the rest of the board members that if, you know, we asked, I believe, Mr. Sokolowski, is that correct that we said that we must address, address the comments that were coming from people that addressed <clears throat> what has been presented by um, our applicant? Is that correct? Yeah, uh, Adam Sokolowski, member. Yeah, Bernie, I, I agree. I appreciate Mr. Gray's comments. He also was cited in the information that we were gotten before and had other public comment. And I think the goal has got to be the end public comment tonight. And, you know, people should know that uh, if they have issues with stormwater, October 5th, go to the planning board. If they get issues with conservation, go to the conservation committee meeting. But we don't need to hash this out. And I understand it, it kind of fits under one of our environmental impacts of our purviews, but it's not new information. We understand, and I understand that people are passionate against this project. I get that. And I hear them and I've heard them and I, I see their point. And you know, there's a reason why this board is appointed, not elected, because if we were elected, then we would have to always go with the popular opinion or we'd never get reelected. And the popular opinion might be to have a long comment for a long period of time. And I don't want to cut people off either, but I do remember our hearings and I know how long it's taken us to get here. Uh, and, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Stabersky, yes. Uh, could, uh, could I ask Mr. Costa as to, oh, we've just heard about stormwater and septic. Is, and I'm wondering, is that within our purview as a, a special permit granting authority to consider those issues or do we delegate those to the conservation commission or other committees and boards in town? Through you, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please comment. So again, Adam Costa, town council. So um, to the question that was just asked, the, the answer is um, it, it depends. So as has been alluded to several times tonight already, and, and as I had uh, mentioned during the last session of the public hearing, section 5320 of your zoning bylaw sets forth the standard for the issuance or denial special permit. And it begins very broadly with a statement that the special permit granting authority must determine whether the benefits of the proposed use out of detrimental impacts on the town and the neighborhood and then it goes on to identify a series of six standards or criteria that the board is to weigh in making that determination. And in some respects, those criteria, those standards are, are broad. And so we, we heard uh, uh, one attorney already referenced the, 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 the criterion that says impacts on the natural environment are an appropriate consideration. Well, obviously that criterion overlaps somewhat with the scope and authority, the purview of the Conservation Commission. The Conservation Commission, exercising its authority under the Wetlands Protection Act, is going to issue, um, if not a, 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 an ANRAD, is going to issue a, an order of conditions for the project. And when it does that, um, it's going to determine whether or not the project complies with the Wetlands Protection Act and the standards that are contained within that act to the extent that those standards apply to the project. That doesn't mean that this board can't inquire. It doesn't mean that this board can't look to other potential impacts, concerns it has with impacts on the natural environment that are beyond the scope of the Wetlands Protection Act, for example. If there were hazardous materials being stored on the site, um, even if the site contained no wetlands whatsoever, um, even if it was not within any wetland buffer whatsoever, but there was a concern on the part of the board that there could be a spill of those hazardous materials and that that would be problematic from, a, from a, an impact on the natural environment perspective, then certainly the board would be within its purview to ask questions and to seek out information to satisfy that concern. Uh, same goes with respect to items like septic. There, there was a reference generally to the adequacy of utilities and public services. And so whether there's an appropriate septic design for the site is something that certainly the board can inquire as to. Now, with that said, when an applicant is before another board, commission, or committee, 
or better yet, has received an approval from another board commissioner committee. It puts the board in a very difficult position. And I certainly, as a board member, wouldn't want to hang my hat on, for example, and I'm not stating specifically anything with respect to the project that's before you, I wouldn't want to hang my hat on a concern that I have as a board member with the septic system if the applicant has submitted an approval already from the Board of Health, which has full authority and discretion with respect to approval of that sort of a system. Um, unless the board member on your board had justified concerns as to why somehow the Board of Health didn't do what it was supposed to do, miss something, there was some error in the record. Otherwise, that's a circumstance where most zoning boards of appeal would defer to the Board of Health. Most zoning boards of appeal would defer to a conservation commission with respect to issues that fall under the Wetlands Protection Act. But there is some overlap here in terms of the standards in your zoning bylaw and what you can consider as a board if you have legitimate concerns. One other thing I want to add, because it was commented on earlier, and it's an important, an important aspect of the board's review process. Um, you know, a suggestion was made concerning, and I forget who it was that made the suggestion, but a suggestion was made about certain additional or other peer reviews that the board may wish to do. And certainly I'm not going to overstep and dictate for the board what peer reviews it should or shouldn't conduct. That's a decision to be made by the board as a whole and by the chair. However, Peer reviews are meant to be exactly that. They're meant to be peer reviews. Reviews of materials that have been submitted by an applicant, sometimes with its initial application, sometimes upon a request of the board. And those, that information, those submittals are reviewed by your peer review consultant. Your peer review consultant isn't an independent analyst engaged by the board to perform studies of his or her own or to, to create designs of his or her own. It's a peer review to review what's been submitted to the board and to determine whether what has been submitted to the board is free from errors, is consistent with the applicable standards, and to highlight any errors or inconsistencies so that those can be corrected and the board can make an informed decision about whether to approve or deny the project based on those submittals. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, does that answer your question, John? More than completely. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, good. Uh, Mr. 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 Sokolowski, question? Yes, yes, question, or maybe just Mr. for Mr. Costa, but if peer reviews are done by other boards, they're in the record as well, so we can access those. Uh, I know the applicant has reported that planning board requested or had peer reviews done on, on, their, uh, on their end in advance, or, or you know, before they denied the permit. Okay, any other questions? Through you, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll confirm that that is absolutely correct. I mean, the, the reality is when you've got a, a sizable or a comprehensive project that requires multiple permits and approvals from different permitting authorities, it makes little sense for each individual board to engage its own engineer to perform the same peer review. So often the peer reviews are shared amongst boards, commissions, and committees. And so I, I advocate for that. I think that it makes sense to, to review what's been submitted, what was submitted to the planning board. Um, and to the extent you have, um, you, you desire information, for example, from the Conservation Commission's peer reviewer, you should seek out that information and make it, make it a part of your record if you think that you need it to make an informed decision. Okay, uh, Chair Common, I think when we go to the final stage, stage of discussion, we're gonna go through this because I think people will think that this is the end all. And I think once these things come through, we're not the, fi we're not the final step in this. And if there's problems with it, they this whole thing can be shut down, correct? I mean, I, th I think people are afraid that this is once they go, this is in there. And I, uh, that's not my impression of what's gonna happen here. If we, even if we approve it or disapprove it, there are steps that are gonna be followed. So I, I'm just trying to tell people that we're just trying to follow along the best we can. We're not, we're, we don't have all the answers. Is that question to me, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, so uh, again, Adam across the town council. So uh, I think that's correct. I mean, I can, I can uh, only speak to what I know. And what I know is that this project requires both site plan approval and a stormwater permit from the planning board. And as you heard a few moments ago, um, those were denied but have been remanded to the planning board for further consideration. So that is not yet a done deal. Um, it's before the zoning board of appeals, of course, for the special permit that is a subject of tonight's hearing. 
Um, I think I heard Attorney Donahue make a reference earlier to a filing that has already been made with the Conservation Commission and what sort of permit or approval will be required from that commission, I'm not certain of, but uh, there, will, there will be some form of uh, permit or approval required or sign off required from the Conservation Commission. It sounds as if the project has already been to the Board of Health. We've heard references to mass DOT approval required for the curb cut and for any improvements that are going to be made as, our, as is proposed um, to, to uh, the, the adjacent uh, state right of way. So that's something that will require a state permitting process. Um, so all of those processes need to be completed and anything else that happens to be on the building inspector's checklist before the inspector is prepared to sign off on construction drawings and allow, allow the commencement of construction to occur. Okay, thank you. You answered the question that I was gonna make uh, uh, the CBA member that, that the Robert Walton is gonna to have to get all the things that he needs and he's not gonna issue a permit unless everything is organized, correct? Attorney, he's not gonna he's not gonna sign off until he has all his ducks in a row. Am I correct? So I, I don't wanna speak for him. I will tell you that my experience with the building inspector and building departments in most communities is they have some sort of a checklist of sorts that identifies um, what they're looking at when an application for a building permit is received. And they review the project to understand what permits and approvals are required. And they go down their list and review each permit to be sure that it has been issued and has not been appealed, or if it has been appealed, that there is some statutory right to proceed at risk. Um, and most building inspectors will go through that checklist and confirm that all permits and approvals have issued before uh, they're willing to grant a, a building permit. Thank you. I'm going to keep quiet and let people make comments. I've said enough. Jen, go ahead, please. Okay, this is um, Amy. Amy? You have to unmute. Is it is this Amy? Yep. Okay. Um, I mean, where's my picture? I'm sorry, I can't get a uh, video. Oh, let me stop my video. Um, I'm I'm Amy Gazen Schwartz. I live at Evans Lane. I am an abutter. I'm a member of the Mill Village East Condominium Association. Our pro we share a property line with this property, and um, I'm not going to speak about all of these other issues, which are important issues. If you feel the need to continue the hearing with the conservation and hear what the Conservation Commission has to say or other things, I respect that. But the core issue of this that the Zoning Board has to deal with, and people have already mentioned this, that the special permit is meant for projects that contribute something special to the town, not for, for a project where the benefits outweigh the detriment. It's not a project where the benefits are kind of equal to what might be the detrimental things. I've read all of the 91 letters submitted by residents as of the past weekend, as well as the comments from other specialists. They've enumerated many potential detriments. Some of those letters are from me, enumerating them in quite detail, as well as issues with incomplete data. But none of these, not one of these, has argued that there is any benefit from this proposal. We're well aware that the regulations allow retail stores here. We're also well aware that they allow retail stores of 4,000 square feet, not 9,300 plus square feet. So I respectfully ask the zoning board to take up its authority under the zoning regulations and deny the special permit. I see no reason why it should be approved. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, uh, Jen. Julie. <clears throat> Julie. Hello. Sorry. Okay. Let's see if this works. <gasps> oh, wow. Thank you. Okay. I have something very quick to say. I'm Julie Cavaco from North Hillside Road. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, at the town meeting, we had a proposal to take some land by eminent domain. 
and it was for a project I think that would have clearly benefited our town, a playing field behind um, the yard adjacent to the um, high school. Um, at that point, because it was being brought to town meeting, it was very clear um, that the majority of the townspeople took the side of the, that attended the meeting, took the side of the um, abutter about the uh, landowner and the people that live behind it. So I would like the zoning board to take all of the valid points that we have um, heard tonight in terms of the uh, on, uh, too big a building, not a, uh, more of a detriment to the um, community, but also understand that um, in general, people um, are keeping an eye out for their neighbors and um, something of that size and that impact to the land and the water um, is very important. And that's all I really have to say. Right. Thank you. Thank you. David, you have a comment? No, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, Julie, <laughs> Jen, uh, hold it, Mr. Decker. Mr. Chairman, it's now uh, 7.44 and yep. we get in about 5.30 if I'm correct. Correct. We've been going through it for two hours. Uh, I think what we, we should be doing is making people that have spoken before at our prior meetings and what have you uh, should step aside and not, not speak unless they have new information because we, you know, some of these things have already been presented and frankly, people are getting worn down listening to them. Maybe that's what they want. Comments by board members. Adam? No, I mean, I'm, I'm good. Like, if there's people that want to talk, let's keep going. Or if you want to take a short break at 8 o'clock in 15 minutes and we get five more people. But for the people listening, you know, we we heard you. If you spoke before, we, we know, uh, you know, we want to hear new information. Uh, but, uh, you know, feel free. I think that we need to move away from the public comment section for October. I mean, uh, I, but I want to give people, a, you know, I don't know what Jen has for a list. If people want to speak and they have something new, let's keep getting after it. We have uh, seven people. Okay. Hang on a second. Uh, Adic, uh, Alex, comment? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, forgive me for being selfish. Um, I have to go back and re-listen to all of this um, and come up with some sort of uh, condensed uh, minutes. So um, I'd like to not have to spend seven hours on the minutes. Um, but I also don't want to say, you know, no one can speak anymore and we should just, you know, call it a night. Um, but yeah, I think uh, we should just try to stick to new information and maybe just hear from people who haven't spoken uh, at the previous meeting. Um, but again, I'm flexible, so whatever you guys want to do. Okay, Mrs. Taberski, comment? Yeah, there's seven people in three minutes. That's three minutes of person. That's 21 minutes. I mean, obviously there's time in between for all, all sorts of other stuff, call it an hour or more. Uh, I think it's clearly doable. I mean, I would ask people not say the same things over again, but if somebody's spoken before, they could have new information or have heard something today that they want to comment on. I don't think we should limit it to uh, to people that try to get information or statements that were made before. Uh, and I think we should try to wrap it up tonight. And if there's seven, we should, as long as we don't talk that much, and I'm as guilty and probably more than others, um, that uh, that we can get it done tonight. Yeah, you're. I'm glad that you're not the only one to feel. I open my mouth up way too much. I should keep quiet. Um, you know, my feeling in this is, is very simple. Um, I'm not going to say I know everything. And we want people to come up with new facts for us because we need that information to make the, the proper decision. And you know, the old saying is the man who tells you he knows everything, you know, first thing he's doing, he's lying to you because we don't know everything. And, and people that give us information only help us to make a decision, but we need concrete on from information that we can use to make a decision. You know, the color of the, of the chair, of the, of the flag or whatever that's out there isn't going to help us. But if they have concrete information, we definitely want to hear from them to help us make the decision. So I, I think we need to continue, and I, I think it's important that we listen to people, but not keep repeating it. So I'm done with what I'm going to say. We want to take a break for a few minutes. 
I say we keep going. Unless somebody five, five Let's minutes. Keep going. Five minutes, Bernie. Okay, we got bathroom break. Five minutes. Uh, we'll convene at um, five of eight. Thank you. A loading dock. And it wouldn't necessarily have to be a trailer truck. It could be a straight truck, too. It could be the Wonder Bread truck. Um, so that car that has to back up the driveway, what if there's a car behind that car? And just think of the confusion that's going to cause. Um, I think they need to come up with a better way for trucks to turn around. I think that's going to be a problem. Um, the second thing I want to mention, I just want to emphasize that Attorney Donahue mentioned that the other permits that the Board of Appeals should go ahead and make Impact decisions before are other by... permits are approved. I think the Board of Appeals has to hear from, and I think uh, Attorney Cost alluded to this, has to hear from other committees or boards as to what their thoughts are in case there's anything detrimental that comes up in that process. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Jen? Hey, Alyssa? Alyssa? I don't know if she's... Sorry, can you hear me now? Yep, no, I can hear okay. you. Sorry, I thought I had unmuted. <laughs> okay, I'll start again there. <laughs> um, okay, so... Um, uh, Elisa Clement, Evans Lane, I'm an abutter. And as an abutter, I wanted to say that um, uh, Attorney Michael Alio's uh, legal brief, um, like many, he, he is representing um, the abutters like myself. And um, to ask you to please, um, you know, consider his legal brief seriously. Um, I also had um, three comments on the presentation of the applicant tonight. Um, the, okay, so first, um, I wanted to comment on, uh, Donahue's statement that, um, that not only Dollar General, but once Dollar General is done with the retail space, that there would be other retailers, um, in the future at that location. Um, his assumption, uh, says to me that if, if he were more familiar with Deerfield, he would know how many vacant spaces we have right now that we actually currently have a serious problem with that. We've lost um, some businesses and we have a real problem in our town with already having uh, too many vacant spaces, retail spaces. Um, and that has been, from the start, that's been a big concern of the abutters such as myself, that this will turn into a vacant building and would be a huge detriment, not only to our town, but to our neighborhood and this location is in our neighborhood. This, um, I mean, it, it is literally part of our neighborhood, these lots of land that they want to build this on. Um, the second point that I wanted to say um, was regarding the, there's a picture that they showed, um, Dollar General's in the distance and they show it from the perspective of the Yankee Candle warehouse. And it's the same picture that John Waite commented on um, living in the neighborhood on that and how incredibly deceptive that picture was. It makes it look like the warehouse is gigantic. I was looking at it going, you know, it, it's, I'm sure it's not that big, you know, <laughs> I live right here. Um, it's just the angle, the way they took it was, is incredibly deceptive. It's, and that warehouse, in addition, instead of it's, that warehouse doesn't feel like part of our neighborhood. It really is tucked back away. It's not bothersome, whereas this would be um, if you look at a, a satellite view, you can see how this, these plots of land share a property line with our neighborhood and are literally part of our neighborhood. Um, and then finally, I wanted to say that, um, you know, they keep talking about this uh, location being on Route 5. They can say that it's on Route 5 as many times as they want, but 
It simply isn't. It is these lots of, of land. Look at the property cards on the town website, please, and see that they are on Mill Village. Um, they're not on Route 5. They are 140 feet from Route 5, according to NASDOT. I spoke to them yesterday, and that's what I was told. I knew it was a great distance. Um, and as such, it, it really is part of our neighborhood. And so that item, you know, considering the detriments to the neighborhood and whether it fits into neighborhood character is very relevant. Thank you so much for hearing this and um, best wishes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Jen? Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes? Okay, great. My name's Annette Fannebecker. I've lived in town since 1980. And one of the things that drew me was definitely the character of the town. I also shop in Greenfield. And guess what? There are two Dollar General stores in Greenfield, about eight miles away, just the amount of miles I go to shop. One on the east side of Greenfield and one on the west side of Greenfield easy access for all of us. I feel that the developer has not acted in good faith throughout this whole process. Many delays, uh, many times asking for things that they never had, and was, was brought up at this meeting, all the misinformation that we've been getting. We have the footprint for a 4,000 square foot store. The developer only has a concern about a business opportunity that would only benefit them, not that it's and it is a detriment to the town. They don't really care about that fact. And it's up to us to say what is, that it's, what is a detriment and what is a benefit. And so that's up to the, Z, the board. And I, I ask you to think about that is only thing that has been brought up today is that it's, there's some very few benefits, very few benefits at all to us. There's only detriments. It's been brought up time and time again. And all the people who have commented all the time over all the years have been brought up their concerns and they're all detriments. So I urge you to deny this permit because there are no benefits. And many people have said that letters have been written. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Jen? The next person, please. Jen? Oh, no. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you, Kip. Go, go ahead. Okay. It's Kip Camosa from Greenfield Road here in Deerfield. Um, I've been to every single one of the planning board meetings and I know the information about this pretty well. Uh, I'd like to speak in favor of this as well as a lot of my friends and neighbors also who just don't wanna waste their time coming forward, unfortunately. Um, especially the part that the board is going to uh, look at sections 5321 through 5326. The social, economic and community needs in this town. We all have to face it that you know, a lot of people in town really aren't that wealthy and they really could use a place to buy affordable goods. And a lot of seniors who, you know, we have a fair amount of them, I think over 48% of our communities, you know, getting elderly, uh, they don't want to drive a lot, especially at night. And this store would be open a lot of hours. It would be very convenient for the folks to, to get to. As far as the traffic flow and the safety, I've lived on Route 5 and 10 for 36 years, and I've been a small business owner on Route 5, less than 500 feet from this location for the past 40 years. And although it does get busy at times, like I'm sitting right now looking in the living room, and I haven't seen a car go by in five minutes. The state has total control over this intersection, 
and they will do what they think is best for our community. They deal with traffic in Boston and Worcester, Lawrence, all over the Commonwealth. I'm sure that they can figure out a good solution for our intersection here. It has plenty of adequate utilities, electricity, water, the fire departments less than a half mile, police departments three quarters of a mile, and the neighborhood character. <laughs> this is kind of funny thing. There's a Yankee Candle warehouse right there, right on the side of uh, Boyden Road, less than 40 feet from the road, but it's hidden by mature trees. It's 28,000 square feet. There's always between 30 and 60 tractor trailers parked there and they go in and out all the time. Down the road, I own three commercial buildings. The smallest one is 6,000 square feet. The largest one is 11,000 square feet. One of them houses a cabinet store where it has 53 foot tractor trailer trucks in there three times a week, never causes backups, hasn't caused any accidents. I used to get motorcycles delivered there three times a week, never had an accident, never had any bad problems. I, I mean, it fits right in with the, the town and what these people have demonstrated, how they've changed the look of this building to fit in with our rural community. I thought they did a pretty good job for what it is. Here again, you look at Yankee Candles, it's just a metal building with a flat roof that is quite large. Once the, tr the trees mature around this site, you probably won't even see this building at all. And the impact to the natural environment, I, there's a lot of water that does come from this site, but it's not just this site. People have to realize there were two large raised septic systems put on the condos next door that diverted a lot of water to this site. Also, the dinosaur house, not the, pre, not the current owners, but the previous owners put in a raised system on the other side. That water used to all flow behind Douglas Galleries, uh, the Butterfly Place, down toward the Deerfield River. Because of that elevated raised system, it stopped that. The applicant has shown that they're going to stop all that water coming. They have a retention pond. They're going to have underground leaching facilities which does not happen now in the winter and spring when the ground thaws, I mean, when the ground's frozen, all the water just flows off that site. This will actually improve that whole area. It will stop that water from flowing into the catch basin. The only water that will be going there will, will, comes off of the highway. And as far as protecting the environment, all the times, all the shopping that local people can do there will Thank save them that. from driving the six miles up to Greenfield. And the potential uh, finance, financial that impact, yes, Sorry, your time is up. Sorry. I guess I should belong to the other group. They get a lot more time. No, everybody got three minutes. But they're all part of the same group, except for the guy in the beginning. You know, he was part, he was representing all these people, but he got, he spoke for 25 minutes, and yet every person behind him is all part of this group. Bernie? Well, the Thank question you. is, do you represent a group? Because that's that was the okay that we let that go. If you represent a group of people, you'll get more time. Well, I... I represent a lot of people that really want this, but you know, they don't want to go through, I, I, I sit here and I, I speak to them. I just had one thing if I could say, the impact of the town, the town will get over $25,000 a year in taxes from this. And they will employ high school kids for part-time jobs. Hey, these kids can sit and do their homework and still make 200 bucks a week. And there's a lot of elderly people that could get part-time jobs here as well. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Kip. Thank Thanks. You. Jen? Yeah, I'm working on it. Okay, Lily. Hi, you guys. Um, I actually am trying to help Gina speak to you, okay? So I have her on my cell phone, and let's see, because she's in a butter, and I think it's really important. Um, so let me, um, Gina, can you speak? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Can you all hear her? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Lily. Um, I'm Gina Cowley at 213 Greenfield Road. I am a direct butter, and I, I've spoken many times, so I will try to be very brief and not redundant, but uh, I do want to just quickly uh, say that I, I do feel like the photograph your images that
was the shop on the side. Um, so I, I just have questions about about those images. Um, uh, so I wanted to just put that out there. Um, and I, I do want to just get back to the idea of a project should contribute something special to the town, and that that specialness should outweigh the detrimental impact. Um, I do know that being um, a small business owner next to a building of that size with a price uh, low price point uh, is something that my shop is not going to be able to compete with. Um, so I have some real concerns financially about a building that size, a retail building that size, um, and not being able to to uh, compete with that. Uh, also, the um, the ecologically impact or the ecological impact that that a building that size um, is going to have, and the carbon footprint that it's going to leave. Um, when there are, and I know this has been said previously, but there are many vacant buildings that they could inhabit um, easily. And I, you know, I, I, so the other uh, point I want to make is that um, I was able to hear Michael um, Aaliyah's uh, legal brief, and I feel like it absolutely represents uh, my standing um, on on uh, the proposed special permit of, of a building of this size. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye, Gina. <laughs> Jen? Okay, it looks like there was somebody with a raised hand and now it's gone. So Biggie Smalls came from the dead and now he's lowered his hand. So I don't see any more raised hands. Oh. Greg? Did you want to say something? If your hand keeps going up and down. Nope. All right, Jen. Uh, Kip was upset he didn't have time. If he wants to come back and speak again, he can. We're giving people a second whack at this. Okay. I have Nicole now. Kip, do you want to say anything? Uh, sure, if I could. Okay. Throughout the course of the public hearings and the uh, information provided for the applicant to the planning board, uh, they did in fact meet the stormwater criteria. Um, not only their engineers met the criteria, the town's engineer agreed with them that they met it. The only reason that it failed was because of the procedure that was done at the planning board. Uh, I was the one person that abstained from voting because they requested information from the applicant. And then the chair of the planning board told them they were going to close the meeting and not give them the opportunity to provide information. That's denying them due process. And that's part of the reason why they're in court right now. It's not because it's a big corporation trying to run over a small town. It's because we didn't follow the rules. We didn't follow the law. And, you know, I didn't want to be part of that. If I would have voted in the affirmative, affirmative, it would have passed because other board members voted for that. But it wasn't done properly. There were a lot of other issues that happened that night as well. And that's the way it went down. So when a lot of these things I listened to tonight just aren't true. They just are not true. And that, you know, it's that's why it's going to end up in court is because, you know, you've got these people consistently saying one thing and it, they just don't want to accept the facts. What happened? The traffic study, their engineer gave us a definitive traffic study. The town paid consultant agreed with them. And, but yet the planning board said, oh, we don't like it. So we're not going to accept it. You, you folks just need to think where this is headed. You know, I guess that's it for right now. All right, thanks, Kip. Anyone else? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Adam Costa, Town Council. Yep. I just want to offer a word of caution. I, I appreciate uh, due process and, and the opportunity for members of the public to speak. I, I do have a concern when what is supposed to be a Zoning Board of Appeals public hearing on special permit criteria 
becomes a discussion of uh, matters that were pending before the planning board and specifically matters that are the subject of pending litigation. Um, yes, there's a remand hearing that is anticipated to occur in October, but there is still underlying litigation. So I would just caution the board to stay focused on what's before it. And unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, that sort of falls into your lap, but I really don't want this to go astray and us begin to have a, a lengthy conversation about pending litigation or matters that were before the planning board when we really ought to be discussing what's currently before the zoning board. Thank you. Okay, uh, Chairman, uh, I'm gonna make a comment, um, Attorney Costa. I think from my short discussion with members that we're not gonna look at what the planning board did. We're gonna look at what we did. And uh, again, we're gonna look we're going to look at what we what we can look at. Um, we're going to, you know, the conservation commission. They got they got to do thing that they you know that their their venue is going to be their venue, and I don't want to get tied up with what other boards do, because I think it gets to be conf confusing for us. We're not experts, and I think our board has been pretty well versed, and I think most of us agree that we're not going to go uh, searching for other areas that could lead to controversy. Because we're not experts. I mean, I'm not a traffic expert. I don't, the only one that's a traffic expert is right over here, Mr. Sekolowski. He's the only one. But not raise know. my hand for that reason. I have a yeah. question when you're done, Murray. Okay. You know, if you want to ask about farmland? Well, then I'm. I, I can talk about that because I own farmland and I farmed, so I can I can address those issues. But uh, other than that, we're just a board that was looking for inputs and in, and in your you know your directions. And I think we're, we'll take a we'll make a good decision. I th I think we're going to be fine. Um, one qu one quick thing, let's go through after uh, Adam talks to you about our next steps to follow. Can we go through that with you, Attorney Costa, so we can organize how we're going to approach this? I guess our discussion has ended with the public, so let's do that. Uh, say no more, Adam. You're next. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just think we have to consider what we want to do moving forward and uh, whether we should close the public hearing tonight and then schedule it to be brought up again in October or, and but we, our meeting will be after planning board, but they're going to have a public hearing. We could put it on and we could wait and see what comes out of the planning board um, and the conservation committee and see if it's approved or denied again, or we could just continue on our own our own path. And you know, I think there is some overlapping um, uh, things that people brought up about environmental concerns that we we can consider or should consider. But I would urge the other members of the board to you know seek out the peer review plans. They don't necessarily have to become part of our record if they become part of the planning board's record. Um, you know some of that stuff uh, because there is differing of opinion the town did hire peer review consultants on some of these areas to to take the time to to go through that um, i just think that we have a, a, a large number of people that have been very vocal and they have some very strong concerns and i think that we listen and i think i i know i where know where people stand i I understand that, and they have a lot of very valid points that we'll consider moving forward. But um, you know, I'm at the point where nothing's gonna, you know, I'm not looking for any more input from uh, from the public. Chairman, thank you, uh, John. Uh, Adam, one thing you said that I think we ought to be cautious of is that if we are going to look at other materials. Anything that we look at or consider as a board should be part of our record. I don't think we should be considering uh, outside information because if we're going to get involved in litigation, we got to base our decision on the information that's before us and all of uh, the board members ought to have access to it or ought to know that it's part of something we're considering. So if there's peer review things that we ought to have, they should be put in the file that we can look at and know what it is. It shouldn't just be kind of out there. You got to find it. Uh, that, that's one thing I, I, I think it's important for process to have a, a good, good solid process for whatever we do. Um, but on, in terms of your comment, and, and this is something I think we should deliberate over, is 
do we continue on our path and act uh, regardless of what the planning board or the conservation commission uh, decisions are. I mean, in one respect, it's it, it could be good because we put uh, you know at least this decision uh, it will be made, and we don't and and those folks will have to re react to us. But on the other hand, there might be information that they gather that might be helpful to us. Uh, Attorney Costa said that there might be, for example, environmental concerns which might not fit within the Wetlands Protection Act. That would be something within our jurisdiction. So for the things that they can't consider, the, the Conservation Commission as well as the Planning Board, we might be able to take into consideration in rendering our decision. So I think it's a tough, I mean, to me, it's a tough call uh, as to whether we wait to get, we be the penultimate decider on this or whether we be kind of first to the plate. Um, I, I think we could take either course and I'd be interested in what the other board members think about this. I, mean, I, don't, know, I don't know if Mr. Costa has, uh, if there's any kind of legal concerns as to whether we go first or last in terms of, uh, in terms of the making a decision. Mr. Costa? Attorney Costa, so, question, comment? So through you, Mr. Chairman, Adam Costa, Town Council. So um, I, I would be cautious and I, I don't want to reiterate uh, what I said before, and, and maybe I can say it a bit clearer. If the board uh, is curious or, or interested or has potential concerns relative to uh, stormwater, well, I think that that is squarely within the jurisdiction of the planning board and will be the subject of a remand hearing before the planning board. And to advise the board to defer to the planning board on matters of stormwater management. If the board, your board, has concerns with wetlands protection, matters that are squarely within the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission, we know that a filing has been made or will be made or will be further pursued with the Conservation Commission. The board to defer to the Conservation Commission. I will you, I think one of the one of the residents, one of the members of the public that spoke tonight, recommended that you um, you give other boards, commissions, committees an opportunity to to opine, to provide feedback. And I guess I remind you that that is part of the process. That when an application is filed with the Zoning Board of Appeals, out, and you can confirm with staff that this occurred. But I I imagine it did because it is is uh, typically what occurs. Notification goes out to the various other permitting authorities. They receive notice that you received an application for a special permit, and they have the opportunity to opine if they have specific concerns. So I'm not suggesting that you can't give them a further opportunity or you can't further inquire, but if there are matters that are squarely within their respective jurisdictions, you generally defer to them. The point I was making before is that when you look at the criteria in your bylaw and you look at something like impact on the natural environment, those impacts may not be limited to stormwater impacts. Those impacts may not be limited to, um, to potential effects on bordering vegetated wetlands. Those impacts may, may be other sorts of environmental impacts to upland areas that are unrelated to stormwater management. It has concerns about those things, specific concerns uh, with some rational basis, it would within your purview to look to the applicant and say, um, we're concerned. I'll give you an example. Uh, solar development that is utilizing some form of battery storage for purposes of, or some, some, some sort of battery for purposes of energy storage. The board says if that battery, if that energy storage is occurring in an upland area, it may, the board reviewing that project says, this is not a conservation commission issue. You're in, you're in an, an upland area far from any wetland resource area stormwater issue that's within the purview typically of a planning board. But the board with a special permit granting authority for this kind of a project, it could say we have concerns about that energy storage, hazard materials, and what impact that could have on the natural environment. So do you, do you have what, what, what safety precautions are you taking? Are you implementing? Can we condition as part of an approval to ensure um, that the natural environment is protected? So I think that's what the board needs to decide. So later, which is, do you have concerns, things that may 
not fall within the purview of one of these other permit authorities, permit authorities that you want to require as part of this current process. Okay, David, you have a comment? David, comment? Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I wasn't looking to speak, if that's what you mean, but I'm, I'm, if everybody's having a turn to comment on yep. proceeding yes, where we're at, then sure, I'm happy to speak up. Um, I guess in, in terms of, you know, thinking about what Adam said, um, John said, uh, you know, Attorney Costa said, in, information is good. I, I want as much information as possible. I, um, I guess um, I hear Attorney Costa saying that <clears throat> the other commissions assess and address what's in their sites. They, they stay in their lane, they focus on what they focus on, and they determine what's uh, within their purview. It feels to me like I'd want to know what their decision is, that, that, that we should be the last car on the train. Why would we give a special permit for something to build if we're not clear as to whether it's going to be fit to be built? And I think this board needs a lot of time to deliberate and, and, and um, uh, you know, I don't know what the process is, you know, uh, continuing forward, uh, but uh, if it means a continuation because we have more work to do and more information and, and, and we're going to have this conservation committee meeting happening shortly, which is not a guarantee, but I suppose it's in the, in the works. Um, I, don't, I don't feel any need to rush into making a decision. Uh, it's a very important, impactful decision. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess, I, I, I guess that, uh, if there's more information to be had um, within a timely manner, then I think that it, we, we deserve to have it and to, to uh, be able to weigh all of the factors that create benefit or detriment. All right, thanks, David. Uh, Alex, any comments? Uh, no, not at, not at this time. Um, okay, Mr. Decker? Pretty well. Bernie. We've been at this thing for over a year, if, I, if I'm correct. I'm not quite sure. Yes, we are. But, yeah. And it, we keep going over it and over it. You know, I think it's time to make a decision. Now, the decision could be twofold tonight. We could decide to, to vote a decision tonight, or we could decide to move it on to the Thursday in January and say, come hell or high water, that's the date we're going to vote. Depending regardless of what the other boards do. And, uh, but it, you know, it's time we stop kicking the can down the road. Okay. So. Uh, you know, I, this, we're gonna, the board's gonna make a decision. It's not up to me, even though maybe I should, but uh, I think we need consensus on this. Um, I think what we need to do, this is what my recommendation is, you can agree with me or disagree with me, is we have to look at some things that we think are important. If stormwater is an issue, we need to say, we want stormwater information. If we think the wetlands are an issue, we need to have that, we look at that. Um, if we're looking at traffic, we, I think with the traffic concerns, I think we have no control of, that's, that's a state and that's, that, that's a whole different issue. But I think if we come up and say, these are the things we wanna look at and we get them in a timely manner, like you said, we're not gonna go on till January. Um, if those are our concerns, the board decides what they're looking for. We'll, we'll decide what they are and put, present them that we want to see those from other boards. And if we can get those, fine. If we can't, then I think we need to, we need to make a decision here. So does anyone object to do it yet to what my suggestion was? So you well, want to I guess the question would be, if I would, Adam, uh, speaking so for your notes, is should we close the public hearing? That's where we're at. Should we close the public hearing and then move to the deliberation phase of this. No, because I don't think we can take any more information, Alec. So, right. so, so if we close the public hearing, we can't take any more information. Yeah, I, 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 there, why would we want to close it in case there's new comments and things arising? 
Okay, let's let let Adam address that because he, he we have discussed this, correct, Adam? You and I have discussed how we're going to close this hearing and what we're going to accept. So um, I think he needs to go over that to make it clear about how we can approach this. Can, can um, I be so can, can I be heard as to what the applicant would like suggest at least to the board? Uh, no, I think you better wait. Let's just hear what Adam has to say. Okay, we'll give you a chance. Just hang on. Be patient. I know this is a long process. Believe me, it's been long for us and we're not happy with it either. This has not been easy. But Adam, what, what and how we're going to approach this information from now on? So, um, so Mr. Chairman, let me, let me clarify a few things. This is Adam Costa, Town Council. So as a preliminary matter, once you close the public hearing, you can receive no new information. So typically the process that is followed by most boards, I, I certainly would, would not recommend, and maybe Attorney Donahue won't want to hear me say this, but I think he knows it. I wouldn't recommend that you close the public hearing tonight and vote a decision. You don't even have a draft decision before you. This is too great, too significant a project to vote a decision, even if it were to be an approval with conditions without that decision before you, or denial without sufficient rationale explained within the, within the four corners of the decision. This is too great a decision to simply wing it and vote and hope that the written document that memorializes that vote created after the fact is sufficient enough. So the way that this sort of a process would typically conclude is when the board believes it has all the information that it needs, information on matters within its purview, information on matters that tend to relate to the standards in the bylaw that it is tasked with applying, then the board would close the public hearing and that would be pursuant to a, a simple majority vote. And once the public hearing is closed, you would then begin the deliberation process you have for a special permit under usual circumstances, 90 days following the close of the public hearing to render a decision. And in, in current circumstances, because of COVID-19, we have some orders that affect that that arguably give you even longer than that. But in most cases, boards don't need as many as 90 days once they close the hearing. They have the information they need. They need to schedule one or two or more deliberation sessions. Uh, those deliberation sessions are meant to discuss approval versus denial. If it's an approval, what the conditions will be. If it's a denial, what the justification for the denial will be. There's no opportunity for new information. There can be occasional clarification of matters, maybe by an applicant, but nothing new. No new public participation for sure. No new submittals made between sessions of deliberation. And ultimately when the deliberations reach the appropriate stage, you will vote on a draft decision that is before you you vote it, you know what it is that you're voting on. Um, the only other comment that I want to make is going back to some of the, the statements the board members made a moment ago about what additional information you need. And Mr. Chairman, you gave the example of wetlands and you gave the example of stormwater. And I guess I want to highlight one thing. And so certainly if the board believes that it needs information that is within its purview that will address the standards in the bylaw. So if it believes that it needs some basic wetlands information that will affect impacts on the natural environment, which is one of the standards in your bylaw, then you can seek that information. I would caution you, as I did a moment ago, that wetlands is something that is squarely within the purview of the Conservation Commission. So I gave you examples of non-wetlands, of non-stormwater, that could be impacts to the natural environment that you might consider, because you would have no assurance that there would be any other public body that would consider it. Traffic is a good example. Traffic is not something that the Conservation Commission is going to consider. Not something necessarily that the Planning Board would consider, at least not to the extent that, to the discretionary extent that you can under the bylaw. So if you believe you need new information on those topics or additional information on those topics, you can seek it. You would not want to close the public hearing until you receive it. And then once you receive it, if you're satisfied, you could then move at that time to close the public hearing. But ultimately it is the applicant that decides the order of its permitting. So an applicant can't be obligated to go to Conservation Commission before it comes to Zoning Board of Appeals or to go to Zoning Board of Appeals before it goes to Planning Board. You have what's before you, which is a special permit application. If there's some overlapping information that will also ultimately be submitted to Conservation Commission or Planning Board or Board of Health that you also need, you can ask for it. 
but under no circumstances would I ever recommend to the board that you say, well, we'd really like to be the last ones here. Say to the applicant, we'd really like to be the last ones here. So go to all the other boards first, and we're gonna keep this process in the air until such time as you do. I don't think you have the, the, the statutory authority to do that. You've got to act on the application that's before you under the bylaw that you have authority to apply and nothing else. I don't, and I don't think we want to do that. Now, uh, Mr. Donahue, I know you've been waiting patiently. So uh, uh, would you to address this please now, if you'd like to? It would probably be more valuable for the board having heard from its council to see what direction you're going in. I mean, I, I would suggest if asked that you would continue this hearing for the, the relatively near future, regardless of other board schedules. But before you do that, if you want specific information that you expect the applicant to produce, we need to know what that is so we can work to produce it in some fashion. By way of example, all the stormwater information that went to the planning board, the detailed stormwater analysis, the review by tie and bond of that same work, the detailed plans of grading and how the drainage all works is already part of your record. So saying you want to know about stormwater doesn't give us any direction of what you want. You've received a lot of information and you've been at this a long time already. So I would echo my brother's comments that I think closing the hearing would be an error so that you can digest what you've heard, figure out what you want from us so we can do it. But I don't think you should, to echo what Attorney Costa says, expect other boards to necessarily be acting. Understand, for example, the only issue before the Conservation Commission is are there wetlands, as that term is defined under the Wetlands Protection Act, on the site? None of those are in the building envelope anyways. They are outside the building envelope. That creates certain jurisdiction of the commission if the commission decides it. But that existence, we don't see any rational relationship to the special permit, whether it's there or not. We've got to deal with it and, and deal with it in some fashion. So we, we need to understand what you want and you may need time to think about what you want and that's fine. We're, we're open to that. Um, you know, rather than trying to rush it uh, this evening just because everybody is getting uh, tired of the exercise. Okay. Do we have some more comments, John? <clears throat> yeah, my, this is what I might suggest as kind of a, uh, a roadmap for the future, is that between now and our next meeting, that the board members identify issues that we want to more thoroughly vet or consider, uh, and and either do that at the next meeting or the meeting afterwards, but to identify what, what our concerns are. I mean, I can tell you that I have two concerns. One, I don't think I'm sufficiently apprised of the benefits, all of the benefits. I mean, I've read your brief, Mr. Donahue, but you know, uh, the benefit of saving six miles driving to Greenfield when people go there several times a week. I mean, I, I want to I want to really hone in on what the benefits will be to our town's people in our town from this facility. And and you know, I have about a paragraph in your in your in your initial submission to us, and I don't think that's deep enough to to really put a full grasp on the benefits. So that's but so that's just one thing. I have a number of concerns that I'd like to kind of be able to, to explore further. I'll give you another one, traffic. I mean, I know Bernie, you said that the state's gonna do what they're gonna do. Well, I don't think as a town, we have to accept the state standards for whether this is gonna be, uh, uh, be more hazardous as an intersection with this particular facility there. Yeah, we can do some mitigation. Is that gonna be enough? I mean, I think we, we don't have to live by the state standards. We have our own standards to, to determine whether the benefits are worth the detriments. And we identify the detriments and identify the benefits and see and, and, and weigh those. So, I mean, I think we can look at a several of, of those criteria to try to come to a decision on this. But we've heard, I mean, we've heard a lot from the public, like the MEPA stuff that one of the uh, one of the one of the members of the public I had no idea about MEPA might be involved in this but they might be and that's something you know he suggested we ask 
to, for MEPA to be involved, MEPA to do analysis on a site, we probably should to, to, to vet this a little more. But it's, it's kind of taking and digesting everything we've heard and identifying the issues, exploring them, and then, you know, starting uh, seeing if we need anything new or more, and then going into our deliberation. So I think the first stage is identifying issues and having the board members do that. I mean, I know for some of us, this is a long process. You know, I, you know I'm used to long process, so it, so it doesn't phase me, but I know we, we should, this is an important thing. We should let it play itself out and just keep, keep in the trenches digging until we get the right answers. Uh, yes, Mr. Donahue, response? Uh, thank you, uh, and, and thank you to the member for the specificity of, of uh, wanting to know about the benefits which we can provide. But, but, but simply saying you want more on traffic doesn't give us any direction. We have given a plethora of information on traffic, current existing conditions, future build conditions, peer review of that, work that's going to be done in the right of way to improve the safety of the intersection, which we're prepared to accept as a condition of approval that it be part and parcel of it. So saying you want more on traffic doesn't tell us what you want. Um, it, you know, now, if I might finish, you may look at all that and conclude that the, the conditions are still too hazardous and that because of traffic, you're going to vote to deny. That's your purview, ultimately. But that doesn't give us direction as to what to provide you to make that reasoned decision. Understood. And I think that's why we need a little time to develop it. I mean, I'm looking more at, you know, we're not experts, but there are people who can render opinions who are experts. Uh, I don't know. We, I don't think we can, we can rely. I don't know if we can obtain those opinions, but is this going to be safer or less or, or better? I mean, the traffic, the, the intersection might be safer with all the work you're doing, uh, but it's, but it's a relative. It decision. Mr. Potter. Thank you. Um, I want to echo what John is saying for the most part. I think that um, I also can, um, can see the process going where uh, we, as Mr. Donahue said, continue the process. Um, and there are certain points that I've heard. And I don't think right now tonight is when we need to list our points or put Mr. Donahue on the spot and say, tell us the benefits. If we want that, we'll give them some time. If they can, I don't know. I, I, I don't feel like there's metrics to uh, some of what um, we need to identify in the conditions for the special permit. There's, there's, there's economic impact. There's, there's other things which it may be hard to measure, but we need to talk about how we regard it. How do we measure something like that? How do we, how do we think about it? Um, and, and if Mr. Donahue and his team can provide, uh, you know, even a bulleted list or a, a, a recap of convince us, what are the benefits? Let it lay it out um, and, and give them that time to, to, to try to uh, present their case in those terms, because I clearly agree. Uh, I, I definitely agree with what John just said, that, that um, I've heard Mr. Donahue explain um, how we are to regard certain things and not other things and um, take in information that um, responds to our concerns. Um, but I don't hear clearly articulated um, how it benefits our greater community. I hear how it might make this project acceptable to us. Um, but I agree with many statements tonight that this is a special permit it should have a special reason. And part of that is the benefit. We wanted to uh, emphasize that the, the, the value to a big building is not that great to us in and of itself. Make a, convince us it's worth it. Why? Um, and I don't think it has to be that great. We see other buildings that have been made, and I could go on. But I do think we need more time for ourselves as a board to identify um, what's going to make this work for us um, what more information? Because I've heard, um, you know, uh, uh, people saying tonight that the, the, the traffic information that we're getting isn't necessarily um, stamped. Is that possible? I don't know. Is, is there more current information? We're hearing things from the public that's bringing new insights, and I think that we ought to consider them and take our time. Um, and I don't think even Mr. Donahue is concerned, especially with the time. 
we, 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 don't, we don't need to be pushed into a decision and we have to deliberate and explore, um, you know, whatever um, I suppose is not within the purview of other committees and, and, and assume that that's our purview. Alex, question, comments? Uh, it sounds like we uh, may need to take uh, some time as individual board members, um, myself included, and just come up with some sort of list of things that we could, that we need um, in order to make the decision and then get them to the applicant. It, it sounds like they need some direction and um, I think uh, I would just like some time to come up with those and try to give them before the next meeting and maybe they can work on that. Um, that's where I, that's where I'm at. Mr. Decker. Comment, Mr. Decker. Yeah, I'm listening. Okay. You know, so what do you want to do? Me meet again on the 15th and, and uh, come up with that joint list from everybody and uh, then hassle about it? Okay. That's the question I had. Well, how do I, we Mr. approach Mr. this? Chair? Yes, who was that asking for a question Adam. comment? Adam, 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 I'm sorry, Adam. Yeah, it would be the second uh, second or uh, first Thursday. Where, where do we meet? Second Thursday of the month, right? Right. So it would be October 8th. Right. Okay, Adam. I corrected. Yeah, so I guess the question, Mr. Chair, is if you're looking for a motion to adjourn uh, for tonight with a continuation of the public hearing, uh, for October 8th, and uh, we'll have to ask okay. Mr. Costa what time. Now, Mr. Chair, that's, that's just a comment I have. And furthermore, I would just remind everybody that we've gotten a lot of information spread out over time. And before we ask anybody, and it doesn't, you know, not specific for this applicant, but we review uh, and ask the town hall staff um, for the information that may already be provided. Um, and, and, and you know we have that we review it because I don't want to sound, sound like I'm kicking the horse to get it moving down the road. I just want to make sure that if we and if we want something from the applicant, we should vote on it. Is if the whole group wants it, a simple majority, and then have uh, put it in writing to the applicant that we need certain specific things. Uh, that would be my stance. Uh, I support that, absolutely. Okay, if we're gonna ask for stuff, we need to be specific. In other words, we're not gonna say, well, we're concerned about the wetlands. Well, we need to be, to help them answer the questions, we've got all that information, or a lot of it, like stormwater drainage already. But if we have specifics, we need to give them exactly what we're looking for so they can answer the questions. Now, if we have a traffic concern like you do, John, I understand that. But what exactly are the traffic concerns? Is it a bicycle pass? Is it the crossing of the roads? So that they can give us an answer, because we're going to be right back to square one. Well, this is the study done, so there's no definitive information. The information is there. The other thing is, how are we going to decide what we're going to pick on? Now, do we drop information off to town hall before the meeting? Do we sit at the meeting and discuss it? When we have the meeting, is it open to the public? So we're going to leave this open because it's going to be a public meeting. So now when we discuss this, we're going to have to leave this meeting open so we get comments from the public. So we're right back to 50 or 60 people in here with questions. Oh, that's not true, Bernie. You know, I, I think that uh, public comment and keeping the public hearing open is two separate things. And maybe Mr. Costa can okay. explain where we are. But I, I think it's important. To, I get it. Keeping the public hearing open, and then we may have to have a short public comment if something new yeah. comes up. That's, but, but I think we need to, you know, if someone in the audience has a question or uh, if we're discussing things and information between ourselves, we don't need to stop our war, our our path of of thought to answer questions and take input constantly. Uh, you know, that's. I that's understand what you're here. saying, however, we're dealing with a with a with a. Uh, open public meeting law. And I'm certainly not purview of all this information. And, and if we don't do it the right way, we're gonna end up with a problem that we don't even, we're gonna get stuck in something we're not even concerned. So well, I know I, what you're I, saying. I, you know, think of it this way. The selectmen have 
public comment at the beginning of their meeting, and then they have a whole public meeting. Yeah. You know, so. Mr. Chairman. Yes, that's why we got this guy here to answer our questions. Go ahead, Adam, okay. your comments. So, so Adam Costa, Town Council. So there, there's often a, a misconception and maybe a bit of confusion between the terms public meeting and public hearing. So the open meeting law requires that meetings of public bodies in Massachusetts be open to the public. Um, we're in a different day and age, thanks to COVID-19 and open to the public means something a bit different these days, hence these, these Zoom meetings. But the general premise is that there needs to be transparency and transparency is best achieved through openness and allowing members of the public free access, typically physical access, but these days something in lieu of physical access to the meeting. There's never any requirement that you allow public comment at a public meeting, unless there is a public hearing that is being conducted as part of the public meeting. When there's a public hearing, and public hearings are called for by specific statutes, when there's a public hearing, the very concept of a public hearing is that there is an opportunity for the public to participate. That aspect of due process is critical to a public hearing. That doesn't mean, however, that when you have a public hearing that extends over multiple meetings of the board, in other words, several sessions of a public hearing, doesn't mean that public comment needs to be allowed at every session of the public hearing. In fact, you could allow it at just a single session of the public hearing. Would I recommend that for a project as, as um, contentious as this, where, where there are opponents and, and, and others in support and an applicant and um, dozens of individuals in attendance? Probably not. I think it makes good sense to proceed as you've been proceeding and allowing the public a fair opportunity at multiple sessions of the public hearing, virtually every session, to speak up and to provide public comment. But particularly as the board sort of gets down to doing its business and moves toward deliberation, I would agree with the comments made by a couple of board members that you have no obligation to continue to open up every session, every meeting, even if the hearing remains open, you have no obligation to open every session to public comment, or you could limit public comment substantially to, you know, 30 minutes or 15 minutes and whomever has an opportunity to speak has an opportunity to speak. You're, you're not denying due process. We've had multiple meetings and the public has, has had multiple opportunities to participate. Um, but that's the reality of working toward the, the objective, which is to render a decision. And as you get closer to doing so, there's more of a need for the board to communicate amongst themselves. Okay, so you, how does the board feel about this? Mr. Decker, comment. Well, you know, I think that everybody who's got some concerns should put a little uh, a punch list together, get it to you individually, not as a group meeting, and let you get it to council, let them look at it. And then, then have him forward it to uh, council for the for the applicant and to, to gather the information we need. Okay. And then we we'll meet on the eighth or or some other date that we can agree on, and let's hammer this thing done. Okay, John. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Either either that or develop a list through discussion at our next meeting. I mean, what Bob is suggesting is obviates the need for another meeting. I, I, I think I'm not in a rush to get it done. I think it's better to get it done right and to think it through, but you know, I, I could go either way. Okay, Dave? Um, I would rather take our list to the next meeting and discuss them. Uh, they could be very overlapping or um, uh, you know, I think I think it's worth us uh, thinking it through together, and and we could build on each other's ideas, or we could, uh, you know, uh, sort of whittle it down and 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 uh, add information to what each other knows, and and make a reasonable decision, and and have that uh, discussion in the public. Uh, Alex. Uh, yeah, we can um, our own list, um, and then discuss it at the next meeting. That's fine. Um, is okay with me. Uh, Adam? I think I'm ready to make that motion based <laughs> on what everybody's heard. If Mr. Chair, if I may? Yes. I would make a motion that we uh, continue the public hearing 
for Dollar General to Thursday, uh, October 8th, 2020, um, with a start time to be no earlier than 5.30 p.m. to accommodate Mr. Stavursky. And, uh, and that would be my motion. Mr. Chair? Yes. You've got to, Adam Cost, the town council, you've got to identify a, a time certain. You can't say no earlier than you've got to identify right. the time well, to which they That's can. what we're going to talk about right now. Okay, I discussion, would, discussion on the motion? If it, yes, discussion on the motion. What about just six o'clock? That gives us all time. Six o'clock, it's a round time, and we go from there. So you probably have to change your motion, I think, Mr. Uh, well, it wasn't seconded. Um, so I can, uh, I'll re restart the motion here. Continue the public hearing for Dollar General uh, to Thursday, October 8th, 2020 at 6 p.m. Do we have a second? A second. Second. Okay. So I guess we have to take a vote on that, right? I'm, I'm half asleep here. Okay. Let me go through the list here. Six o'clock. Mr. Decker. Yes. Uh, Mr. Sokolowski. Yes. Mr. Sadowski is yes. Alex. Yes. Mr. Stavarski. Yes. And Mr. Potter. Yes. Yes. Okay. I have a question, Mr. Sadowski. Oh, here we go. To adjourn. Do we have any other business that night? The minutes. Uh, besides yeah. the minutes? <laughs> Just the minutes. Around? So anything else that were to come up may have to be after that. Correct. So, so be it. So, so minutes wise, if people have issues with the minutes, and to, because this is more clerical, maybe yes. they should uh, get their comments uh, to Alex before the meeting so they could be considered. Alex, okay. give me a call later. Tomorrow, I will uh, tell you what I want to talk about. Okay. Can you give me your number afterwards or whenever? I'll give it to you afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. I see Mr. Donahue. Do you have a comment for us? No. No. Okay. Okay. So we're going to try to get you a, a, a working list, and we'll go from there. Okay. Does that sound all right with you? We're going to, we're going to do our best. Move forward. Sure. Okay. All right. Glad to receive anything either. Okay. Via Mr. Costa or through the town. Or if not, okay. we'll be here on the eighth. Okay. We'd like to try to get it kind of shortened down a little bit, so we're specifically looking for things that we have concern about. If you can address those if you can. Okay. Okay. Bernie. Bernie. Yeah. Mr. Decker. Uh, can you make sure that when we meet on the eighth, if anything else has come in? relative to anything from any of the other boards that do we understand what's what's been it okay okay that's gonna fall on jen right jen yeah <laughs> <laughs> they're Thanks. going to i just want to make sure it doesn't slip through the rug right and can, can i may i ask is everything is there a, there's there a file a computer file that we can access may are I you start? kidding me there everything is online yeah. <laughs> everything is on our website that uh, like any, um, everything that has been given to us, public comment, uh, you know, I mean, maybe some decisions, maybe some of the, uh, like the CONCOM decisions or something, but if it was part of the packet that, that we were presenting and part of this meeting, it's all up on our website. There's actually two locations. There's a red bar on our main page um, at the very top. And then if you go to the meeting dates in the calendar and click on ZBA, then it's, they're all listed there. And you have to look very carefully because they're little tiny icons and it, it's PDFs and just click on them. If there's something that you need specifically or you want to see it in paper, you know, email me, we can make an appointment. You could come in and, you know, I can leave it out in the foyer. You could take a look at it and have it in person. So it's not something that you're looking at a large map on a computer screen. Um, more than happy to share any of that information with anybody that needs it and wants it. So I'm, I was thinking more about like something that might have been filed with the planning board that was a peer review that we talked talk about that a little bit. Is everything like that in those PDFs 
that's uh, I, I believe that Sue did give those to me to put up there from the peer review. So, I mean, if it was part of this public record of people wanting to see it, we did put it there. If you want something specifically, um, email me and I can get that for you. Thank you. For you, Mr. Chairman, we provided a Dropbox to the town of all information from the planning board and, the, and all information in one place for this filing. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? I'd like to thank you, Mr. Donahue and uh, Attorney Costa, or, or Attorney uh, Donahue, for your patience. Uh, this has been a long process, and board members for bearing with me for being so illiterate in or, or non-compliant in all these things that we go through and the mistakes I've made. Um, this is a long process. Uh, we're tired, uh, but I think we've done a good job. I think I'm I, I'm impressed with this board. I'll be honest, with you, I'm impressed with this board. We've been very thorough. Uh, we've been patient. Um, this has not been easy. We've got a lot of pressure from people, but a lot of comments made. You know, I hear it all the time and just say, well, we're going to go by the process. And I know I'm not the only one that's been hearing about this stuff. Uh, and I, I think we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do the best we can. And I appreciate all you people spending your time. And there's been a lot of, a lot of materials that we're looking through. Um, not everyone's going to be happy no matter which side we take. But I, th I, th I think we're going to do the right thing and we're, we're getting good directions from you, Mark, and, and from, from Adam, and that's all we can ask for. And from the help from the, from the central office, and I wanna thank the police department for letting us come in here and use their offices because I could certainly not do this at home. So, Will do we I have adjourn? a motion to close the meeting? Will we adjourn? Second. Okay. Second? Yeah. Okay, uh, vote to close the meeting, Mr. Decker. Yes. Uh, Mr. Sokolowski. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Stabersky. Yes, uh, adjourn the meeting. Would be oh, I'm sorry, adjourn. I'm getting tired. I've been tired. Alex. Yes. Um, I was say Mr. Costa. You're a voting member. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Potter. Yes. Thank you for your patience. And Thank we'll you. see us all on um, October. <laughs> I got it right into my hand. Then I'll wash my hand and forget. Thanks, gentlemen. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. Good night. Good night.